Will all Sergeant at Arms please start their recordings? PC recording has started. So, record, so recording has started. Background has started. Thank you, Sergeant Hope. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Committee on Public Housing. At this time, will all panelists please turn on your videos? Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate mode or silent mode. Thank you. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I am Council Member Alika Ampre Samuel, Chair of the Committee on Public Housing. Today, we will hold an oversight hearing on mold conditions at NYCHA developments. We will learn about the conditions contributing to the mold problem, and we will also hear about steps NYCHA is taking to abate mold, to prevent its future growth, and to keep residents safe from its harmful effects. We will also hear introduction number 1911, sponsored by Council Member Richie Torres, in relation to the provision of information to residents of NYCHA regarding the mold ombudsman, ombudsperson. Residents everywhere, whether they are living in the city or the suburbs, private or public housing, have a right to housing that is safe, clean, and habitable. This means a home that is free from serious health and safety hazards like lead paint, rats, and other vermin. It also means a home that is free from dangerous, toxic mold. The presence of mold is not just a mild irritant. It can cause symptoms like cough, sore throat, or skin rash, but it can also cause or exacerbate more serious health issues. For example, Mold can cause serious reactions in people with asthma or other respiratory illnesses and can cause infections in people who are immunocompromised or have chronic lung diseases. For too many of the 400,000 New Yorkers who live in NYCHA developments, however, mold has long been a persistent problem. Many of these residents are children and many suffer from health issues that can make mold so dangerous. The COVID-19 crisis has made matters worse. While most people have been forced to stay in their homes because of the pandemic, it is worse for those who have been forced to stay inside homes that are plagued with mold. This pandemic has hit everyone hard, but it's had, it has hit the most undes underserved in our communities the hardest. The mold issue at NYCHA has been such a problem that it's been the subject of numerous investigations and reports in the last several years. The issue got so bad in 2013, the class action lawsuit was filed against NYCHA. The lawsuit settled in 2014, imposing certain mold abatement requirements on the authority. But NYCHA repeatedly failed to comply with the terms of that settlement, forcing the court to amend them in 2015, and then again in 2018. The lawsuit on, alone wasn't enough. Mold also, one of the physical condition standards set forth in the 2019 HUD NYCHA agreement. A year and a half later, NYCHA has already fallen behind on its mold abatement plan. We are here today to get answers. And we are here today because transparency seems to evade the NYCHA, the New York City Housing Authority. Greg Smith published another article in the city today entitled The Perfect Storm. And what he details about the mold coupled with poor ventilation creates an environment that exacerbates respiratory illnesses, which can only be deadly by itself. When we add coronavirus to this equation, it becomes insurmountable. Right now, I would like to just share an, expert, um, an excerpt, excuse me, everyone. I would like to share an excerpt taken directly from NYCHA's website. 
NYCHA is committed to providing residents with the healthy and safe homes they deserve. To fulfill this commitment, NYCHA is taking proactive measures to meet the obligations of both the 2018 Revised Bias Consent Decree and the 2019 HUD Agreement. And as part of this process, NYCHA has revised its standard procedure for addressing mold complaints and introduced mold busters, an innovative new program informed by industry standards to effectively and efficiently remediate mold. NYCHA began a citywide rollout of mold busters in January of 2019 and completed implementation on September 2nd of 2019. This excerpt reads as if there isn't any mold anywhere to be found in the 175,000 units that fall under the auspices of NYCHA. But we know that is far from the truth. There were units that had mold in 2018, had mold in 2019, and still have mold today on October 7th of 2020. Due to persistent leaks, mold has reappeared in at least 30% of the units they were remediated from 2016 to 2018. And additionally, COVID-19 has created even more limits to repairs and remediation. NYCHA's Independent Mold Removal Unit, the MRU, has, by their own June reporting, only assisted 600 households and resolved 250 complaints. Today's numbers are just as unimpressive. Here we are, years upon years, federal cases and a federal monitor, a tenant ombudsperson, authority-wide strategic planning, mold specific planning, deadlines coming and going, extensions, more deadlines, more extensions, reworking of plans, more rescheduled deadlines, resurgence of mold in already abated units, and all the while, the problems of mold infestation growing, lingering, and continuing to damage New Yorkers who are most vulnerable. Today, the committee is trying to learn what has gone wrong in NYCHA's efforts to fix its mold problem and what can be done differently. We recognize that some amount of mold is inevitable, but many of the conditions that accelerate its growth can be addressed. NYCHA can improve ventilation in its buildings. NYCHA can stop focusing on superficial patchwork cleanup and instead prioritize deep cleaning that gets at the root cause of mold. Today, the committee hopes to learn what NYCHA can be doing better to more efficiently address this problem. I would like to thank my fellow committee members who are present today and the um, council will read those names. And now I will turn it over to committee council to, oh, you know what, let me stop there because I know that we're going to hear the bill from council member Richie Torres. And so I would like to um, utilize this time to allow for council member Torres to speak on the bill before we hear testimony. And before you speak council member, I just wanted to say to you, I thank you so much for your partnership and work with the public housing committee. Um, you did an amazing job as the former chair and an amazing job as the oversight committee chair. Um, I'm not sure if we'll be able to have another committee meeting together, um, but I look forward to working with you as you champion the voices of the public housing community, not just in New York, but in the United States of America, as you move on to being a member of the United States House of Representatives. Um, and so with that, Council Member Torres. Uh, uh, thank you, Alika, for those kind words. And, you know, I have great admiration for you and your leadership on the Public Housing Committee. And uh, I look forward to working with you as I enter the, the next chapter in my life, you know, I, I introduced a bill on molds out of frustration. You know, I'm appalled by the failures of mold removal at the New York City Housing Authority. And thank God for leaders like you, Alika. Thank God for journalists like Greg Smith and organizations like Metro IAF. You know, nearly a decade ago, Metro IAF sued the New York City Housing Authority for failing to remove mold from public housing and violating the rights of public housing residents, particularly those with asthma under the American Disabilities Act. And NYCHA settled that lawsuit in 2013. And in the seven years since then, 
we are no closer to solving the mold crisis in public housing. You know, Metro IF has been agitating for the installation of roof vans since 2016. And we know from microecologies that the mold crisis, as much as 50% of the mold crisis in public housing could be solved by simply replacing the roof vans. 50%, even with all the disinvestment in public housing. And NYCHA pledged in 2018 that it would repair all the broken roof vans by 2019 only to renege. And now NYCHA has pledged that it will replace 10,000 roof vans by June of 2021. And I, I desperately wanna hear what that plan looks like because for us to be waiting since 2013 is unacceptable. And, you know, we're living in a time of high-end racial awareness when there's greater awareness of systemic racism. I would submit to you nowhere is there greater systemic racism than in public housing, which is ground zero for disinvestment and mismanagement. You know, most of the people who live in public housing are overwhelmingly low-income people of color. And if the people in public housing had powerful lawyers and political action committees and powerful lobbyists, there would be no mold crisis persisting for nearly a decade. So it's unacceptable. We're sick and tired of the excuse making and we deserve to hear from NYCHA a concrete plan for finally fulfilling the pledge of repairing 10,000 roof vans or replacing them. Um, we cannot afford to have the latest broken pledge because the story of NYCHA far too often has been a story of broken promises. And it's time to keep our word to the residents of public housing. Thank you so much, Council Member Torres. And you're absolutely right. Um, we have also been joined, I have the list now, we have been joined by Council Member Torres, Council Member Menchaca, Council Member Ayala, Council Member Diaz, Council Member Jonai, Council Member Salamanca, and we've also been joined by our Majority Leader, Lori Combo. And with that, we will now hear from our Committee Council to go over some procedural items. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Audrey Sun, Counsel to the City Council's Committee on Public Housing. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will call on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. First, we will hear testimony from a NYCHA resident, Ms. Karen Blondell, followed by NYCHA and then members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order we will be limiting council member questions to two minutes, including responses. And if there are more questions, we will have another round of questions. So first I would like to call Ms. Karen Blondell. So good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Karen Blondell. I'm an organizer at the Fifth Avenue Committee I'm also very active uh, civically in, in the Red Hook uh, community. I'm a part of Resilient Red Hook, Red Hook Initiative, Red Hook Local Leaders, you name it. But I also have background in engineering and I did local law 11 inspections for NYCHA uh, up until 2016 when I started organizing. And so uh, I know exactly what the roofs look like. I've walked on them. There are no walkways on those roofs. And I literally did um, a presentation with Council Member Torres about two weeks ago, um, and it was entitled, We Need a Plumber. And we were talking about the ballasted roofs that have these uh, 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 stone shards. And every time someone walks on those roofs, whether it's a police officer, a tenant crossing the roof, or a construction worker, there is penetration that happens on that roof. Um, through the membrane. And so those roofs are a roofer's dream because every time you get water penetration, you're going to need a roofer and another trades to come out and do work. 
But what happens is that number one, we find as public housing residents uh, that the management team, the, the supers don't often check on the roofs to make sure that the drains are cleared. So we have a lot of ponding on the roof and once water starts ponding, it's gonna find it's uh, uh, any hole, any puncture, and it's going to start penetrating from the top down. So I live on the first floor. By the time water gets to me, I know we have a major problem because they had to go through six uh, stories to get to me. Um, so in Red Hook, we had a full re roof replacement by FEMA because we were hit hard by Sandy. Um, but not often does New York City Housing Authority actually secure the money for the drain system at the same time as they secure the money for the roof. The roof is a system and that system requires drainage. So it's really important that they have enough staff knowledgeable to go up there and to check those roofs for these punctures, for these, um, uh, these um, uh, different particles and things that could go inside of the drain, including when construction workers go up there and have a beer or two while they're working. And we know that's a part of what happens in construction. And so all of these things are being found in the drain. It's compromising the drain. And then what's happening is the, the water has to find its way home. And it finds its way home through our walls and um, it causes mold. So I wanted to bring that up about the drainage system. I also want to bring up about the fact that uh, we found that asbestos is a toxin. And for years they were using asbestos to wrap around the uh, hot water riser because a hot water riser is gonna have condensation in a wall. And so every time the water is turned on, there's condensation going on in the inner wall. So once they found out that asbestos was toxic and they started removing that material, uh, they haven't replaced any material to absorb that condensation. So this is another area where you're gonna have continued mold. Um, I don't often see, I have never seen a HEPA device brought out to the developments to dry any of these areas once water penetration has, has breached it. And that's another issue. They're not following the protocol set by the, man, uh, the manufacturer on how to uh, use preventive maintenance on the building, on the risers, and what to do in replacement of the asbestos uh, insulation that we were using prior in these buildings. And so I would actually look at each building. One good thing about Red Hook is that we do have bathroom windows. And so we can regulate the humidity in the bathroom uh, by opening and closing that window. Um, at least I can, but for elderly, that might still be a stretch because they would have to lean over the bathtub and have enough strength to actually pull the window up and down. And that's the second thing, the windows. The windows of old used to go out like this and come in. Those were the best windows, but they're also more costly. And as you know, New York City Housing Authority goes for low is bitter. And so we now have these windows with these balances on the sides. And you can look at any development across the five boroughs and you will see that at least 25 to 50% of those windows are off skewed. That means that those balances are broke and that's another area where water penetration is coming into uh, our apartments and causing mold. Um, even the manufacturers tell you that one of the uh, places you'll find a lot of mold in a multiple dwelling building is in the window wells. So that's the place where the window locks down into the groove and those side well areas where this balancer, where this balancing um, uh, beams are. And finally, what I found with Local Law 11 is that contractors will cut corners wherever they can. And so I'm windows sorry. require caulking. And what's happening is that they're using very little or no caulking. And if there's no caulking to hold that window sealed, um, you're going to have water penetration through the lintel and the sills. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that testimony, Ms. Blondella. I, I really appreciate the information. I also wanted to let everyone know that we've also been joined by um, Councilmember Van Bramer. 
committee council, Audrey. Thank you. We will now proceed with testimony from the administration. Elena Tenchikova, Daniel Green, Razul Azarnajad, Vlada Kenneth, Brian Honan, and Is everyone still there? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Audrey, son, I think you froze. Chair, just give us one second. Okay, we will now be hearing uh, from the administration uh, who will be testifying uh, Vito Mesicillo, uh, Daniel Green, Razo Azen Najad, Elena Ten Kikova, Vlada Kenneth, Brian Honan, and Emma Utiliano. Okay, can you hear me? I will now administer the oath. After I say the oath, please wait for me to call your name and respond one by one. Please raise your hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before the committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Vito Masachilo? I do. Elena Tenekova. Tenekova, I do. Daniel Green. I do. Razo Azanajad. I do. Vlada Kenev. I do. Brian Honan. And Emma Vitaliano. I believe uh, Mr. Honan would like to affirm. Um, I do, I'm sorry, I was on double Thank mute you. there. Thank you, you may begin when you're ready. Hold on, Jose, we're, we're still missing Emma. Oh. Yep. Okay, would you like me to proceed? So just hold on one moment. We're waiting on Emma's response. So Emma is um, not going to be testifying um, or providing testimony. She's uh, in a support role. Okay, you can proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon. Chair Alikas Amprey Samuel, members of the Committee on Public Housing and other members of the City Council, NYCHA residents and members of the public. Good afternoon. I am Vito Mustachulo, NYCHA's General Manager and Chief Operating Officer. I am pleased to be joined by Chief Compliance Officer Daniel Green, Vice President for Healthy Homes, Razul Azanajad, Senior Director of Office of Mold Assessment and Remediation, Elena Tenchikova, and Vice President and capital for Capital, Vlada Kinev. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss NYCHA's efforts to provide residents with the healthy and safe homes that they deserve. Under the leadership of Chair Russ, 
and our Blueprint for Change vision. In collaboration with our partners, such as the Federal Monitor, we are transforming this agency so we can be a better landlord for our residents and improve their quality of life. Combating mold is a key focus of this work, and we are eager to share with you the progress that we have made, as well as our plans for continued improvement. Although mold has been a persistent challenge at the authority for many years, we have made its prevention and remediation a top priority. In light of the pandemic, we increased our focus on mold remediation, and we understand the importance of these efforts. Before I describe our work in this area, I'd like to give you some context on why mold is so challenging and how we got to where we are today. The majority of NYCHA's buildings are more than a half century old. Many of them have not received the needed major capital improvements vital to their infrastructure. Mold is a symptom of our ailing buildings, a consequence of severe lack of funding to properly maintain and repair an aging infrastructure, replace leaking roofs, windows, pointing, crumbling pipes, and old ventilation systems. And our ability to maintain sufficient staffing levels to keep up with the mold that result from these conditions. Mold is a challenge for any building owner, especially those operating large multifamily buildings. Mold is everywhere. Its spores are present in the air, both indoors and outdoors. Many building materials provide a favorable environment for it to grow, making its occurrence very common. So this is something that many landlords contend with and is not unique to NYCHA. At NYCHA, the issue is twofold. We lack the funding to make all of the capital repairs that are needed. Due to decades of federal government underfunding, our buildings are now confronting over a $40 billion need in capital expenditures. Identifying the source of mold is not straightforward. The moisture that promotes grilled mold can come from any sources such as a leaking roof, leaking pipes, or another apartment. If the source or sources are not properly identified, the mold may come back. Once the source is identified, the corrections can sometimes involve complex repairs to address it or even require full capital replacement of the system. To address this critical issue for our residents, we implemented Mold Busters, an innovative program to combat mold developed a mold and leaks action plan in collaboration with the federal monitor, as well as residents and resident advocates, and are working with an independent court appointed ombudsperson to resolve mold issues. We are also bringing major renovations to our buildings through a, a variety of preservation strategies and investments. In 2016, NYCHA began working with a court appointed special master, a certified industrial hygienist and building systems experts to improve and update our mold inspection and remediation process. This was part of our work to fulfill the obligations of the 2014 Bias Consent Decree, which requires NYCHA to abate mold and excessive moisture and their root cause in a timely and effective manner. Under the guidance of the special master, we launched the Mold Busters pilot program at 38 developments in 2017. In 2018, we established NYCHA's first ever office of mold assessment and remediation. In accordance with the revised bias consent decree, we began rolling out mold busters to all of our developments in January of 2019, a process we completed in September of that year. An independent ombudsperson and ombudsperson call center were also put in place as part of the revised bias consent decree to address residents' complaints about leaks, mold, and excess of moisture repair orders. The ombudsperson and OCC work with NYCHA to prioritize mold reports and to expedite their remediation. Mold busters is the foundation for our progress in this area. Developed in consultation with industry experts, it's an aggressive program that enables our staff to more successfully identify the source of mold and remediate it. It's five key components, which are focused on finding and correcting the source of mold mark a significant evolution in our approach. New tools. Our staff use high-tech tools that provide them with information to determine the source of the excess of moisture that is causing the mold. This includes, includes moisture meters, specifically designed to, to differentiate between condensation moisture and moisture within the walls from a leak or from water infiltration. Other tools are, are anemometers, 
which measure ventilation, hygrometers, which measure relative humidity, humidity, and boroscopes, which provide a less invasive view into a wall. Finding the right source or sources of the excess of moisture is the first step to correcting underlying conditions causing mold. New materials. We are using a mold inhibiting paint after remediating some of our toughest mold cases where we are concerned about mold recurrence. New strategies. All of this vital information is being recorded in a new inspection format designed with a mold expert and enhanced by our, our, I, our IT staff. This new format is on staff's handhelds and it guides them through recording the information and then choosing the next steps and remediation methods, all with system guided checks along the way. In the end, this produces a documented project plan with information that can be passed along to each craft involved in completing the work. New training. Our staff received new enhanced mold assessment and remediation training through eight hours of classroom training and hands-on field training at each development. In addition to training the superintendents and assistant superintendents, we included skilled trades representatives so they can learn the new remediation methods alongside the staff that will be directing them. Accountability. The new protocol requires photos taken of the area involved from the first work order to the last at each step in the new craft involved. Providing a documented remediation plan. Additionally, after all work is completed, the superintendent or assistant superintendent is then required to complete a follow-up inspection, certifying the work was done and documenting that also with a photo. In July of 2017, NYCHA completed inspections for over 38,000 mold work orders and performed remediation work for nearly 22,000 work orders. As mentioned earlier, we established NYCHA's Office of Mold Assessment and Remediation, or OMAR, in 2018, whose staff are dedicated to addressing mold. Since then, NYCHA has invested $15 million in that program and will be investing an additional $20 million over the next five years. OMAR is also investing $50 million in federal capital funding for ventilation work. In 2019, in partnership with training experts, we trained almost 2,900 staff who perform or supervise mold remediation work. We have also trained over 550 staff in nearly 1,400 field training sessions. Our training program, unfortunately, was put on hold in March due to the pandemic, but has since restarted in accordance with COVID-19 safety protocols. OMAR is organized into the following units. The Mold Response Unit, which is composed of project managers and resident communication associates focused on customer service. They work with the independent ombudsperson call center to resolve mold and leaks that have not been addressed by the NYCHA staff who initially respond. The resident communication associates interact with both residents and development staff to ensure inspections are scheduled and to expedite the completion of work orders. Residents seem to be pleased with this improved communication and dedication to customer service. Contract administration, which works to improve building ventilation by spearheading the ventilation initiative where engineering and contractor services are used to ass assess and modernize the ventilation systems. It also oversees contracts to remediate the most critical mold and leak cases. Analytics and process change, which works with independent data analysts to analyze mold data and determine how we can further refine the mold busters process. This team improved data reporting and transparency through a metrics dashboard accessible to all staff and is currently developing a new standard procedure for addressing leaks. OMAR already revised NYCHA's standard procedure on addressing mold complaints and OMAR is leading the efforts outlined in our mold and leaks action plan, which was developed as part of the 2019 HUD agreement and approved by the Federal Monitor in March of this year. The Mold and Leaks Action Plan outlines strategies for preparing and providing remediation plans for residents within five days, eliminating the backlog of long-term work orders, remediating, remediating mold and its underlying root cause within seven days for repairs that can be performed by a maintenance worker or caretaker, or within 15 days for repairs that must be performed by skilled trades. 
increasing staff and vendor capacity for mold and developing relocation policies, restructuring skilled trade scheduling and improving communication practices, improving and repairing mechanical ventilation, developing clear and enforceable protocols for roof and roof end inspections, improving communication and engagement with residents on mold prevention and remediation processes, training of staff on mold response, increasing staff capacity for addressing emergency leaks, and creating a new standard procedure for leak control. To improve how we address mold at the authority, we have been collaborating with partners such as the Mold Remediation Specialists at Microecologies Incorporated, the Bias Independent Data Analyst, Stout, the Ombudsperson Call Center, and the court appointed ombudsperson, Mr. Cesar De Castro, as well as the federal monitor. These relationships are proving to be successful. For instance, in the last reporting period, May 2020 through July 2020, no cases required action from the mold ombudsperson. In addition, residents now have several channels for reporting mold complaints. NYCHA's Compliance Department, the federal monitor, and the OCC entities that all communicate and, commun and coordinate regularly to address residents' concerns. NYCHA informed residents of how they can obtain assistance from the OCC through the NYCHA website, a rent insert, emails, newsletters, flyers, social media posts, a NYCHA journal, journal article, as well as outreach to resident leadership. It's an effective partnership. The OCC has assisted over 2,200 households with mold and leak related complaints as of July 31st, 2020. As of that date, NYCHA is in the process of resolving complaints for 74% of those families and fully resolved cases for 525 residents. I would like to note that neither the HUD agreement nor the BIAS consent decree requires NYCHA to replace roof bands. We are doing this proactively to ensure we comply with the requirements that all roof fans are operable. We are replacing roof fans portfolio wide thanks to a variety of funding streams. And we inspect roof fans on a monthly basis, repairing or replacing them whenever necessary. Since 2018, we have spent nearly $3.7 million on repairing or replacing roof fans. We are also replacing nearly 950 roofs, benefiting 180,000 residents thanks to a $1.3 billion investment from Mayor de Blasio. These upgrades will go a long way in eliminating the leaks that create favorable conditions for mold. Please note that the timeline to complete this work has been impacted by the pandemic. The connection between aging infrastructure and dire need of repair and mold growth and recurrence cannot be emphasized enough. That is why our blueprint preservation strategies which will bring top to bottom renovation of every building in our portfolio are an essential part of our work to combat mold across the authority. These renovations involve new kitchens and bathrooms, ventilation and plumbing, areas that are critical to preventing mold from occurring in the first place. We thank you for your support of these preservation ideas and strategies, which will bring improved quality of life for our residents in so many ways. The way forward, while mold is a long-standing and challenging issue, we have the partners and plans we need to overcome it. With the Mold Busters, mold Busters Program, the Mold and Leaks Action Plan, major capital investment, and partners like the Federal Monitor and OCC, we will continue to make real improvements at the authority that make a real difference for residents. Again, we thank you for your support. As always, we welcome your suggestions as well as feedback from our residents on how we can continue to make progress together. Residents, of course, our, are our most important stakeholder and are at the center of everything that we do. Right. We are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Vito. Um, so we'll just jump right into it. Um, I just have like just some clarifying questions first based on your testimony. Um, on page four, under taking action in mold leaks, you say that since, two, since July 2017, NYCHA has completed inspections for over 38,000 mold work orders and performed remediation work for nearly 22,000 work orders. And so just reading that, I'm, I'm under the impression that you're talking about 
from 2017 until now. So we're looking at a number of 38,000 work orders that came in and 22,000 work orders were remediated. So can you kind of clarify what, what does that actually mean? And as of today, how many work orders across NYCHA's portfolio are related to moisture and mold in NYCHA developments? Give us a context of what's happening today and what do those numbers actually mean? So the numbers are, um, as you indicated, uh, they are the number of work orders um, that were addressed um, during that time period. Um, we are, we will work on getting you um, what percentage that represents of the total number of work orders. Um, I don't have that in front of me um, at this minute, but while we are going through the hearing, we'll make sure that we get back to you with that answer. So how many work orders, as of today right now, and how many open work orders do you have that are related to moisture and mold? So as of uh, today, we have um, 15,000 517 open mold work orders. And uh, we have a breakdown of the categories. Uh, it's important to note that within that 15,517, uh, 11,212 uh, or 72% are either in progress or the work has already been completed. And the reason why it is still open is because it is still pending a QA inspection that's required uh, to close the work order. Okay, so can you give me the breakdown then? Since so within the 15,517 open mold work orders, so there are 883 that are awaiting initial inspection. There are 2,376 where the inspection has been completed. There are 9,529 where repairs are underway. How many, wait, say that number again? Sure, 9,529, where repairs are in progress. There are 1,683, where the repairs have been completed. And there are 1,046 that are in a reinspection process. That totals 1,000, uh, 15,000, 517. Okay, so going to going back to the 9,529 repairs in progress, can you break that down? What does that mean in, in uh, repairs in progress? So someone came out, like what, what does that mean? Sure, so the inspection had already taken place uh, to determine what the, uh, the root cause was. And, and a mold, uh, in order to remediate a mold condition, it requires several steps. Um, so it's not, um, most of the repairs are categorized as complex as opposed to simple. A simple repair is something that uh, a maintenance worker or a caretaker can address on their own. A complex case um, involves multiple trades. Um, so when I say that they're in progress, um, it could mean that the, the, the wall had been opened, uh, the plumbers um, have identified uh, where the leak is, and are currently working on uh, repairing the leak, but there are additional steps that need to be ta taken after the source um, has been abated. So in order to do a proper mold remediation um, repair, it requires several steps in the process and, and oftentimes several different trades. So out of the 9,529 that are in progress, how many are simple and how many are complex? Okay, I don't have the breakdown within, for, within that category. I, what I do have is for, the, for year to date 2020, of the mold work orders that have been created. So there were 20,842 work orders created. Now, some of those are still in the inspection process. Hey, wait, hold on. Sure, Ken. You're giving me a different set of numbers now. Right, I don't have the breakdown for, between complex and simple. 
for the the nine thousand five hundred and twenty nine. Okay. But I, I want to put your question into context. Okay. Um, right. So again, if you look at the total year to date numbers, um, of within the twenty thousand eight hundred and forty two. Uh, total work orders created. Right. We have, and the, there are still that um, some that are in progress, but there were 13,350 that were considered to be complex repairs compared to 502, which were considered to be simple repairs. So I just want to, you know, we can certainly get you the breakdown within the open work orders. I, again, okay, so so let me so so into, so out yeah, of the yeah. year to date, the thirteen thousand three hundred and fifty that were complex. It's safe to say that out of this this nine thousand five hundred and twenty two repairs in progress, some of those are complex. Because if we're looking at thirteen thousand three hundred and fifty that are complex and five hundred twenty that are simple, just looking at the percentage of complex issues versus simple issues, that 9,529 number that we're seeing would have the majority, we can say, uh, majority of those are complex. Right, so- I mean, sorry, that's so, kind of safe to say, right? Yeah, right, yeah. So I was just given the numbers. So within, and, and I will ask Elena uh, to jump in um, on this question, but within the 9,529, 93 of those are simple repairs, 9,436 are complex. Oh, so you do have the number, okay. Yeah, no, no, I, as I said, we were working on it as we were, as okay. we were talking. But okay, um, so Elena, you... Elena, if you'd like to add to, to, this, uh, to this answer. Yeah, if there's any further uh, questions that you have on how um, each of the phases are broken down, uh, uh, once the inspection is completed, I could further provide uh, the breakdown as well. So Elena, what I'm trying to get a sense of and paint a picture as mm -hmm. to what does it look like right now today on October 7th, the mm -hmm. status of apartments in New York City Public Housing, New York City Housing Authority, like how many complex repairs are needed right now today in our developments. And when we talk about, and you, know, just, you just kind of gave a description of what complex could mean. And I heard like open walls, you know, you can go, I've, I've been in way too many apartments now where in the middle of, of repairing mold, they will go through, open up walls. I go in and I see plastic covering, you know, expo, you know uh, exposed yeah. pipes and everything else. And so I'm trying to get a sense of what do these apartments look like today and what's happening to paint the picture because we have, you know, a whole lot of questions after this. Right. But I'm trying to get a sense of where we are today in order to be able to have a halfway decent hearing right now. No, absolutely. So and, and what I, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Elena, go ahead. Okay. Um, my apologies. Um, thank you. Uh, and I apologize. I don't know how to raise my hand on Zoom. So I've been like <laughs> trying to wave down. Um, uh, so uh, be between the, what I would um, look at is where we have inspection completed and inspection started. And I would combine those and that would represent 2,310 inspections completed that are complex repairs plus the 9,436, uh, which uh, we uh, already started some work in. And so in total, that would equal to 11,746. What I do want to say I'm confused. that- You don't have to say it again because to start does not mean to finish. You're correct. saying start, so what, what I'm confused right that, now. So uh, what we mean by started is that we already began work with at least one of the work orders um, that are child under the parent work order. So that's what it means. Um, and uh, when we uh, look at, um, you know, I, I think that the context that I wanna bring into all of this um, is um, we've 
uh, under COVID circumstances, um, in, uh, under the emergency protocols, we still continued to make sure to prioritize mold and uh, mold remediation. The, the, the only thing that we suspended as part of that was the paint work orders um, and or the paint work that, uh, at this point. So I'm gonna throw another different set of number. This combines both open and closed work orders, but I'll give you context of, you know, of between the mold uh, uh, parent and the child that are open, how many of those uh, remain open because of painting. And um, I think that that's gonna be an important piece to bring context in relationship to where we started work and where we still um, have outstanding gaps. Uh, and that's, this is out of the 15,517 number? Right, so um, if we looked at as October 1st, 2020, there were 16,033 child, uh, uh, children work orders for mold that were outside of the guidance. Right, so we, uh, you know, as, as you know, we work very closely with dependent uh, uh, data analysts and we build dashboards and modules in order to track our progress. And one of the things that we build um, a dashboard is, is what's in the, pro uh, within the guidance and what is outside. Again, the only thing that's really outside of the guidance is um, the paint. And when we look at those 16,033 uh, children work orders that are outside of the guidance, 15,011 of them are for paint. So that's the relationship that I want to kind of really, you know, uh, piece together that a lot of our work that is outside of the guidance. Um, I'm not a mathematician. I'm just kind of confused by the numbers again, because I asked if this was when I asked the question about how many work orders do you have right now? It, the number was 15,517. Mm -hmm. And so now you're giving me a universe of some 16,300. It's, it's kind of, I'm, I'm trying to. And, and Councilmember, we can certainly make this simple. We can provide you with more detailed numbers uh, in response to your questions. Uh, the 15,517 that I referenced um, represent open mold work orders as of today. Right? Um, and but you know, I, I, the one point I do want to raise, and I, I think you know, thank you for for bringing this uh, to everyone's attention. Um, but a vast majority of the cases that we're seeing um, are complex cases, right? and I think it speaks volumes to what we have been saying now for at least the three years that I have been here, and the year or so that the new chair uh, Greg Russ has been here. Uh, we need uh, capital investment, right? and if you look at the capital needs just for plumbing systems replacement work um, in our portfolio, um, outside of the developments that are being identified for PACT or RAD, we're talking about $9.5 billion uh, that we need, right? And so these complex cases um, honestly fall into that category. That, that's what we need the $9.5 billion for. No, I, so, I get that veto, but before we start talking about, like we all know you need money right? We know that. We understand that. I'm just trying to get a sense of when you get the money, do you know what you're going to do with it? Do you have an accurate accounting of what's happening in each apartment? That's what we're trying to figure. You know, that, that I'm trying to just get an understanding of what is going on in each apartment right now in the middle of a pandemic where we see that this pandemic has a direct impact on the respiratory system. And so we're trying to figure out, we already know there's already been an issue. And so now, you know, where, per, where someone lives can 100% kill them. So we're trying to get a sense of what is going on. So I understand there's a need for billions of dollars. I'm trying to figure out what the heck is going on with the 15,517 work orders that are open now with the majority of them being complex issues. That's what I'm trying to figure out. It shouldn't be that complicated. So uh, again, council member, it, it's, we can give you um, a further breakdown of where those 9,529 are in, um, in progress. Uh, but you know, these do require a significant amount of work uh, to correct the condition. Um, so oftentimes, 
it's not just identifying one source or just correcting a um, this is replacing a small section of pipe. You know, oftentimes it, it takes uh, it requires uh, time and energy to uh, find the source, or in some cases, multiple sources. Uh, you know, the one thing I will say about the, what this program has been doing, which um, you know, I, I think we need to recognize, is in years past, before we had this program in place, um, I would argue that most of the repairs uh, that related that were related to mold were almost all categorized as simple repairs, which is why we saw in the past uh, a higher a recurrence rate than we're seeing today. Uh, so we're addressing the underlying uh, root cause of the moisture in a way that we have not done before. Right? And there's obviously more work that we need to do, uh, but it, it's important to note that within these open mold work orders, a vast majority of those fall into that category. It requires much more significant repair work to address the underlying condition. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to figure out what does that mean? Like what, what are the actual repairs? Like what's happening? Get a sense of, you know, is it 25% of it is related to the piping? 25% of it is related to a leaky roof. You know, 25% sure. of it is related to, you know, like an internal, you know, pipe bus. And there's another one is with the ventilate. Like just trying to get a sense of what does that mean within this number that you gave us in order to have better context. But just mm -hmm. moving on, because I'm sure that my colleagues, um, sure. you know, And I do have... want to say that with the new system, um, and the, the, the capturing of the data uh, that we have not captured before, we will be able to give you a further breakdown of where those 9,529 fall. Um, and we can provide more information uh, about the types of repairs that are necessary to complete the remediation. Okay, um, uh, there's a lot of you know, folks that wanna have qu that to ask questions. We've also been joined by Council Member Gibson and um, Council Member Traeger. Uh, how many of these service requests that we see now are more than 100 days old? But can you give me a sense of what's the oldest, in addition to that, but what's the oldest um, work order? Oh, Alina, do you have that um, at hand? Um, um, I have uh, how many we have uh, that are uh, over 100 days old. Um, so, um, uh, there are currently 7,296 uh, mold work orders that are over 100 uh, days old. Okay. Okay. So it's safe to say that out of 7,296, the majority of them are actually complex work orders. Uh, and I'm just going back to the testimony about, you know, this being the top priority for the administration. Can you explain like, how can you have so many complex work orders at a hundred, more than a hundred days old? Sure. So certainly, I, I think the testimony that, that I provided really does speak to um, the urgency that we're giving uh, mold and, and the investments that we've already made. Uh, but again, it requires a significant amount of, of more investment. Um, we have $50 million allocated for the roof fan replacements. We just recently moved uh, an additional $4 million um, into uh, existing contracts. We're going to increase that to $7 million uh, to address outstanding mold work orders uh, for this calendar year, for the remaining of this calendar year. Um, we are investing significant amounts of money. But again, I will go back to these complex repairs. Um, it requires capital investment. Uh, and honestly, that's really, um, the, really the, the way so we So what are do you today. have now? What do you have now? What Right now, what funding sources are currently used to abate mold and nitro developments? What are you working with? So we are working with um, a variety of, of funding streams. So there's the city capital, which we just talked about, um, to replace roofs uh, and to do um, exterior work on our buildings. That represents approximately $1.6 uh, billion, uh, of which $1.3 billion has already been invested. We have federal capital and federal operating dollars 
um, that are being dedicated, um, as well as we're, we are um, anticipating uh, using some of the additional state monies, uh, the money that was given to us last year uh, to address mold remediation. So we're using any and all funding streams uh, that are available to us. The 1.3 billion that's already invested, um, is 1. it 1.3 like billion was already, already invested, invested in roofs. Already invested and spent or like already it's, in con under contract? It's, 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 it's been completed or? Um... Vito, I can answer this question. Oh, sure, Vlada, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, so the 1.3 billion is committed to the mayoral uh, capital roof replacement program. Um, we just to kind of step back and uh, acknowledge that originally it was a 13 tranche program that the capital uh, team has consolidated to eight tranches. Uh, it is in, by doing that shaved off uh, potentially six years uh, off of the original timeline. Um, and so to date, we have completed work on 14 developments and um, 189 roofs are completed. Right. And, and I want to add to what Vlada just said, it's important to note that we did um, shave off a, a significant amount of time over six years from the original completion date of the roof replacements. Um, and I do want to give credit to the mayor uh, for that. Uh, the mayor and I were sitting on a newly um, installed roof at one of our developments. Um, and when he asked me what the plan was moving forward, how many years would it take to complete it? Um, he said we had to do better. So I, I think that that and what we have done uh, by shaving six years off of the roof replacement uh, plan, I think that really, you know, it speaks to the importance that we're giving um, these issues, right? That we oh. take mold and we take the underlying conditions seriously uh, shaving six years off of a completion for the replacement of, I believe it's 970 or so roofs, um, is significant. So just to, just to, just throwing that out there, and I'm gonna end my questions here for now. Um, back to this 9,529 that are in progress. Um, how many of those are within the developments that are receiving the investments for the roof repairs? we would have to do that analysis and get back to you. And just trying to get a sense of how do you prioritize, like how do you, you know, where you spend your money um, and comparing that to where the complaints are coming in. When you say prioritize our investments, are you talking about the roof replacements? Roof replacements, um, piping, whatever oh, so money that you have coming in, how do you prioritize that based on the, how do you sure. prioritize them? Yeah, I mean, Vlada, would you like to speak to the, the methodology that was used for the roof replacements? Yeah, um, again, I'm not as familiar with the roof replacement methodology. I'm relatively new in this role and I can get back to you, but I, I do uh, understand that there is uh, a uh, negotiations around the city agreement funds where uh, we are talking to the monitor that is more comprehensive that would include plumbing and, and mold related repairs. And that methodology includes looking at mold complaints, looking at the number of units where the, com the mold complaints are the highest and prioritizing those developments. Right, now for roofs also, we've looked at the age of the roofs. Uh, we've looked at their physical conditions, uh, not dissimilar from what we do with our capital investments when we look at heating plants. We look at the age of the heating plant. We look at its um, history, repair history. Um, with respect to the roof fan replacements, um, for the phases uh, that we've um, that we've begun, phase one represents developments with the largest number of roof fans within a development. But we also overlaid um, additional data, um, resident information uh, for those developments. So we're addressing uh, developments with a higher percentage of seniors um, in the first phase. Um, so we look at data, not just specific to the buildings, but also to the occupants as well. Okay, um, Audrey, I have other questions, but I will um, hold off to allow my colleagues to, um, to ask questions right now. Great, thank you. 
And also as a reminder to uh, the members of the administration, um, could you please remain unmuted for the duration of the question period? It'll just help the time run a little more smoothly and efficiently. Um, thank you. So I will now call on council members to ask questions in the order that they've used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, please keep your questions to two minutes, including responses. And if there's a second round of questions, uh, we'll go around again in turn. Uh, Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and let you know when your time is up. Uh, so first we'll begin with council member Torres followed by council member Menchaca. Yep. Sure. Um, since I have two minutes, I'm going to ask uh, two two questions, yes or no. So NYCHA has promised to uh, replace 10,000 roof fans by June of 2021. NYCHA so far has only replaced three. In order for you to achieve your own goal, you would have to install uh, more than 1,000 roof fans every single month until June. Do you presently have the capacity to install more than a thousand roof fans at the New York City Housing Authority so that you can achieve your goal. That's question number one. Certainly, uh, thank you uh, for that question. I'm not quite sure where the three um, number comes from. Within the first phase- So what's um, the right I'm, number? What is the right number if it's not three? Sure, so within the first phase um, that where we committed to um, installing six, 1,669, which is a number as we discussed, um, sort of that we will revisit as we um, roll out the installation of the roof fans. That's a number that the chair and I are still holding to um, as of today. And as we um, begin the installations- I'm sorry, um, is 10,000 is 10, by May accurate? Of June 2020 accurate? Ten, it's approximately 10,000 by so, June. So do you, do you have the capacity to install more than 1,000 as of today, yes or no? It's a simple. Do we have it as of today? Uh, yes. As of today, we have- More um, than 1,000 a month so that you could achieve that goal. We are working towards that goal. Um, do, you, do, you pre do you presently have the capacity to do it? We believe we do. To install more than 1,000 a month? We believe that we do. And we will As continue, opposed, and we will continue to bring on the, the, additional the, contractors to increase to make sure that we meet that that goal. The, the second question, and I might ask a little more time if I can. Um, so the the city reports that there were forty seven developments, twenty two of which were senior only, that had higher than average infection rates. You know, one of those developments on one fifty second Street and and um, Cortland Avenue had an infection rate as high as 9% compared to a citywide average of 2.9%. Um, and nearly all of those developments had mechanical ventilation systems that date back to the 1950s and 1960s. It's been well established that poorly ventilated, overcrowded apartments like those in NYCHA are, in, are petri dishes for the spread of COVID-19. Do, do you acknowledge that the failure to repair or replace the mechanical systems, the mechanical ventilation systems at those developments could have been a contributing factor in COVID-19 infection, morbidity and mortality at those developments. My, according to the city, more than 900 residents were infected and more than 60 died. So first, sir, it, it, the pandemic has been uh, has it impacted not just NYCHA and not just the city of New York, but the entire country and the entire world. And, and as we have seen from the statistics, um, COVID-19 has impacted communities um, of lower income and black and brown communities more than it has any other community. Right, but I'm referring to those 47 developments, I, I, right? I, I have, do not, have, my answer is do, no, do you, sir, to your question. Do, do, you think do, there's a, do you think there's a relationship no, I do not. Because this is the premise. You don't think there's a relationship between ventilation and COVID coronavirus transmission? No, sir, I don't. And I, and I have not seen. The, the, and I have the, not I've seen. I have not seen medical or scientific data. Well, well I just want to say the, the the opinion of the housing authority is out of touch with the science because the science is pretty clear that poor ventilation is a contributing factor. Does raise the risk of transmission. 
Sir, what I will say first is the, the assumption is that our roof fans are not working. That's not an accurate assumption. Then how, how do you explain that? So let me, if you, I may finish. Let me, let me, let me finish. know, but how do you explain there are disproportionately higher rates of infection, mortality, and morbidity in developments that have these outdated systems? Is that a coincidence? Well, sir, sir, do you know what the same rates are in the surrounding geographic area? You're identifying some very specific buildings. I, I do believe that those developments were in zip codes and geographic areas where there were higher um, percentages that, that above what the citywide um, averages were. Um, so I, I don't believe that just by focusing on a specific building is an accurate statement. It's 47 buildings out of 306, you know, the uh, demographics. Sir, sir, do you know what the percentages of infection rate were in that, that neighborhood? Has, has, well, I'm just curious, has NYCHA done an analysis to study the relationship between ventilation and coronavirus transmission? We have not. Is NYCHA willing to do that analysis or? We are willing to work with anyone who wants to um, help us improve on our process. And if there is information that we should have um, that will help direct where we should be doing our roof fan replacements um, in a more expeditious manner, we'd be more than glad to sit down with anyone right, and have those conversations. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'll be honest with you. I'm troubled and I'll end it here. We know two facts. We know that ventilated, poorly ventilated apartments are petri dishes for coronavirus transmission. We That's know this. And we also known that there was likely to be a subsequent wave in the fall and in the winter. And during the summer, the New York City Housing Authority and the City of New York missed an opportunity to ensure that these apartments were properly ventilated so that residents could be protected from future transmission. Like I refuse to believe that New York City with a workforce of 400,000 people and a budget of $90 billion could not figure out how to ensure that these apartments had roof fans, enough ventilation to protect them from coronavirus transmission. Um, and I just think that's a real failure on the part, not only of NYCHA, but the whole administration. This is not rocket science. Like as much as 50% of the mold crisis in public housing could be solved simply by replacing the roof fans. I agree, NYCHA has a $40 billion capital need. It will take time to replace the roofs and the bricks and, and, the, and, the, and the pipes, but roof fans are straightforward. That is the simplest means of driving down the rates of mold growth in public housing. And I feel like the housing authority in the city of New York is failing. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, I just want to read something real quick, just, just for the record. One second. Um, the United States Center for Disease Control and Prevention issued new guidance on its website Monday, October 5th, acknowledging what virus experts and environmental engineers have been stressing for months. It's easy to catch the coronavirus and develop COVID-19, the disease that causes it, from other people. And this can even happen when you're six feet apart or more. This is especially true when you're together in a closed space with poor air circulation, where the virus may act differently. So I just wanted to read that from the CDC who updated their guidelines. And I wanted to put that in the record and sure. let the facts be known. So, but I, I do want to add though, again, so since 2018, we have um, been performing monthly um, inspections of the roof fans, which have resulted in um, over 1,100 roof fans being repaired and, and over 1,600 roof fans being replaced. Uh, so it's not, a, and, and again, I want to preface what I said earlier, um, our roof fans are working, right? The replacement of the roof fans is to um, upgrade them with a roof fan that has a, a, a larger capacity um, that, that goes beyond what our, our current roof fans uh, can do now. Right? We're not replacing in kind. Right? Uh, certainly, we will continue to work with the health experts um, as we have throughout the entire pandemic. Uh, we will uh, reach out to the City Department of Health. We've been in contact with the State Department of Health. Uh, we've been following CDC guidance. You're talking about um, 
a, you know, our roof fans uh, provide for exhaust, uh, but they don't introduce ventil air, new air. Right? They basically are a conduit for moisture and condensation to leave the, um, the room. Right? But these are, this is not an HVAC system. Right? The roof fan does not serve that purpose. And I believe that what you're citing from the CDC report, and, and I, we will do some additional research, is for a system that provides for recirculation of air. Right? And these roof fans do not provide that. Audrey. Uh, thank you. Um, we will continue with council member questions. Um, but uh, we will ask the Sergeant at Arms to increase the timer for council members to five minutes to give them adequate time to present their questions to the administration. Uh, we will now take questions from council member Menchaca, followed by council member Jonai. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of the committee. I want to start by bringing us to into Red Hook. And the first voice that we heard from the community was uh, from Karen Blondell, who has been an incredible activist on the ground, uh, technician, and just all around incredible voice for uh, for the work that's happening at, our, at Red Hook, including what RHI is doing. And so I'm going to bring two questions that I think are going to be potentially informative around strategy that's coming from the ground. And one of them is, uh, and, and Vito, if you can answer these questions, um, can the health and hospitals and other healthcare institutions that are currently in response to COVID, um, and I'm thinking about the telemedicine and the COVID testing, rapid response, all that work, can they expand in their scope to include the respiratory health screenings and the medical support in response to the tenants who live in mold identified apartments. Is that something that we can do? I think it's certainly um, it's something that we would like to have further conversation with you about. It, it does sound um, like it would be a, a good place for us to start. Um, so if you would like to, um, to work with us on that, we would be more than glad to. Great, and there are a lot of folks on the ground that are thinking about this. Uh, I will say this that uh, in Red Hook, we took a lot of the old infrastructure that we built after Sandy uh, and restructured it for COVID times. Uh, we built a, uh, with RHI and some other uh, uh, partners, we built out a phone tree very quickly. Um, as the mutual aid work was, was happening, we were able to kind of get into people's homes and we were identifying issues. Uh, RHI is the, the kind of core component of that, but we think that there's a really great link between what's happening right now in COVID and the respiratory issues that this committee is is really um, highlighting. The next question really is Certainly. about- And Councilmember, I would say that um, in addition to the what you mentioned, um, obviously we would want to bring in the City Department of Health as well as um, the uh, New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation. Yes. Uh, we need to have those experts with us as well. Absolutely. Let's bring all of them in and, and figure this out because we're, we're in neighborhoods right now. We can, we can just add a scope that will allow for us to understand and bring data to this question uh, and this real massive public health crisis. Um, what prevents the city of New York from establishing, establishing an interagency and multi-sector mold response and removal team? Um, this would lessen the dependency on NYCHA to be the full, full response uh, agency. Uh, is that is that possible? So that it becomes an interagency across all the mold issues rather than just NYCHA. I, I would like for us to have further conversation about that and understand more clearly what um, what what you would envision. I mean, certainly, well, like, really, just okay. like rounding out the troops, bringing more more resources. Uh, we, we understand that there's a money issue. Uh, and you mentioned a $9 billion number before, and I couldn't catch what that was exactly connected to. Was that just the ruse? No, actually the $9.5 billion is what we, um, we have estimated that we need to do plumbing systems replacement work um, 
So that's what we need to uh, to replace our domestic water supplies, our waste lines, um, where we are seeing, um, especially in the complex cases, uh, that that is the root cause. For for the entire the entire portfolio of NYCHA, uh, with the exception of the the uh, developments that are are being um, identified for PACT or RAD. So it's okay. with, it's it's for 110,000 units. Uh, the $9.5 billion is the need uh, to replace the plumbing systems uh, in 110,000 units. I think that's the number, uh, it's close to the number that we, we just put into the budget for the four jails. I just wanna remind everybody about that. Um, but can you, can you just go back a little bit and talk a little bit about this interagency piece and really expanding the ability for a multi-sector approach to solving solving mold, both as a response and to remove it. What what issues come up for you right now? Um, and I'll follow up with you after my time is up. Uh, but these are these are things that our local community members are asking, just to bring in more resources to to address mold across the entire city, in and out of NYCHA. Sure. So. I mean, obviously, look, we um, time's expired. Sorry, uh, uh, Elena, do you uh, would you like to answer the council member's last question? Um, I, I think again, council member, we we have embraced um, every opportunity to to work with outside partners, um, and and cer certainly by expanding that, um, I, I would love that opportunity uh, to hear again more in more detail what some of the thoughts are and as to how we can expand that um, and to have a working okay. group right. uh, okay uh, so great on both of these questions um, I will I will follow up with you and Red Hook will be at the table thank you so all much all right excellent thank you thank you thank you chair we will now take questions from council member Jonai time starts now I want to thank the chair and I want to thank council member uh, Richie Torres and council member Menchaca uh, for the out of the box thinking. Um, if I just may answer council member Menchaca, uh, until we get real leadership in this administration, don't expect much of anything. I say that wholeheartedly and sadly with a heavy heart that I say that. Uh, the work that uh, Richie's been doing when it comes to the issues that have been plaguing uh, NYCHA families uh, for decades, uh, no one um, can understate your valuable work and chair what you're doing. Vito, personally, I think you're, I enjoy you. We have so many conversations. You've been a problem solver for many of the issues that impact my two nature facilities, uh, which is Throgs Neck and Pelham uh, Parkway Housing. But the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. The default answer consistently has been underfunding by the federal government. In 2012, when this mayor ran for office and promised to solve the NYCHA problems, he did so, knowing what it was walking into with years of experience as a council member and as a public advocate. Seven years later, we find ourselves in the same position, worse than when he first took office. I'm gonna follow up on council member Torres' question. How many roof fans are currently not working throughout the NYCHA complexes? So, uh, sir, uh, we again um, have since 2018 have been inspecting roof fans on a monthly basis. Um, the August report, um, I believe, indicated that we had found 98% of them um, operational. I uh, would like someone just to please correct my number. But I believe as of August, um, during the inspection process, 98% were operating. While they're looking that up, Vita, of the 9,000 current work orders that are in place, I didn't hear an answer as to how many of them are, are complicated. And by complicated, by the way, we mean roof water leaks, uh, brick and mortar, uh, pointing uh, work that's needed and plumbing. Uh, which is not very complicated because this is all in a maintenance of uh, apartment buildings. What so is of the, the number? Yeah. Of the 9,500 um, open mold work orders, we did provide a breakdown 
9,436 of those were considered complex, uh, 93 simple repairs. So of the 93 simple repairs, how long of those work would have been open? Uh, we'd have to get back to you on, on the, how long those, those specific work orders have been opened. So in a simple repair, it means basically, you know, plaster, paint, clean up, right? I would imagine. Is that a simple repair? It, it, it's a repair that generally would not require multiple trades. Right? So it, we uh, were easily, um, we were able to easily identify the source um, and that a maintenance worker, um, you know, could address not only the source, but also then correct the condition. So it, it's really, it's typically where, again, it doesn't require a sequencing of a, of a work order uh, from one skill trade to the next. Right. So my, and, my, then to put it in, to put in perspective, since January, uh, Pelham Parkway has received 130 tickets regarding to mold repair that is consistent and not being addressed. And currently we have 50 apartments at Frog's Neck Housing with major mold issues that have been ongoing for years, uh, which is which contradicts the policy of mold repair and immediate remediation, 48 hour response. This is a con constant follow up, follow through, close the ticket out, identify a problem, come back six months later to the same issue. I don't expect much to come out of this and I pray that 2021 Come sooner than later with a new mayor and a new administration, someone that's really taken on these challenges. Because till then, all we're doing is jeopardizing the lives of the 175,000 families in NYCHA systems, which is consistent majority brown and black residents that are paying the price. And as was stated earlier, if they had lobbyists, they would never be in this circumstance. Uh, and the question, you know, because your background when you were working at HPD, at what point does gross negligence become criminal? Because what we have here is gross negligence of this administration to protect the families that occupy the 175,000 units in our city. When will it become criminal that someone actually goes to jail for the lives that they destroyed, the pain and suffering that they allowed, they allowed to continue, for those that have asthma to suffer and actually become a, a, a play a role in the mortality rates of this city. And if you can answer that, Vito, I would love an answer. No, sir, um, I, I can't answer that question. Um, but what I would um, offer though, in response to your earlier statement, I've been in government now for almost four decades. Right? And when the mayor asked me to come to NYCHA, he asked me to come over uh, to try to make improvements. Um, and, and one of the reasons why I said yes was because of the mayor's commitment to public housing. And in four decades, I have not seen a mayor make those same commitments to uh, trying to address the needs of public housing where others have failed to. Right. And, you know, we have seen more investment, city investment um, in the last seven years than I have seen in 40 years. Uh, so I, sir, when it comes to this administration's commitment, the mayor stood with me and we signed the agreement with the HUD secretary and with the Southern District. Um, the city of New York did not have to sign that agreement. But the mayor's commitment to public housing, I think, um, was demonstrated when he stood there and signed that agreement with us and committed to um, making further uh, city capital investments in public housing. Then maybe the chair can ask this question. Are we better off today than we were in 2012? Are you telling me that NYCHA housing is safer and the quality of life of those residents is better today than it was seven years ago? Is that what you're telling me, Vito? So I will tell you, we can sir, look at the open work orders and we can show the number of people that are suffering that they can't get the basic of repairs, let alone heat and hot water, which is a whole other catastrophe. Well, sir, I would argue that, that that in the last three years since I have been here, yes, quality of life has improved. Right. Do we are we done? Absolutely not. <clears throat> By no means. But have we made 
improvements um, in the quality of life and in the conditions of the buildings in the three years that I have been here? I would say yes, absolutely. But I guess we didn't need the HUD to step in. Uh, and we no, 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 sir, I never said that. I never said that. And I never said that, that we're, we're done. There's a lot more work to be done. And, and certainly the HUD agreement and the collaboration that we have with HUD and the monitor and the Southern District um, was necessary. And it's putting us on, on the right track. It's creating um, work plans that we had not seen before. It's introducing a new way of thinking. Um, but I would also argue too that we were moving in uh, the right direction even prior to the signing of the agreement, right? But with the federal monitor and with all of the new partners that we have um, in making NYCHA a better place for residents to live, uh, I'm, I, I believe that we're moving in the right direction, I do. Thank you. Thank you. We will now circle back to Chair Amprey Samuel for additional questions. If any other council members have further questions, please raise your hand on Zoom and we will call on you in turn. Chair Amprey Samuel. How do you, like, can you just talk about your communication plan um, to residents? Um, in particular, can we just kind of go through the, um, if a resident is not home and you are you know, seeking access, can you just let me know like how is that actually going and what's really happening with those repairs and those individual um, sure. residents? I'll, I'm gonna ask Elena, would you please speak to um, how the process works and, and what the procedure is if there's a no access um, and also, sure. if, we're, and if we require access uh, to another unit where we have identified where the source of the leak might be coming from? Sure. So um, uh, the, when the inspection uh, or request for repair is initiated, um, uh, it is either done through contact in the CCC or through my NYCHA app. Um, the tenant is, uh, my resident is has to... Um, uh, a selected date within four days. So that way we could comply with the four day uh, uh, inspection requirement, uh, as well as issuing of the uh, remediation plan within five days. Um, at that point, uh, if we settle on a date, that's the date that the tenant, uh, I'm sorry, that the staff will go. Um, in the case where uh, we are not able to come to an agreement, uh, the resident is informed that we will um, um, uh, that we will uh, come within the next uh, that same day. Now, if this is happening in the morning, staff will attempt to make entrance uh, in the uh, afternoon. If the conversation uh, or the request comes in uh, in the PM, then we're going the next day. Um, and at that point, um, we would uh, 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 also inform the tenant that we may use the right to access. Um, and uh, uh, at that point, if we fail to gain entry when we're making the attempt, um, you know, with, within that day uh, or the uh, following business day, if this is coming in the uh, afternoon, then uh, we would leave a 48 hour notice and then, you know, attempt to come back. Can you um, just kind of go through the numbers, like out of the, the, um, the work orders that are like pending, like is there a percentage of those that um, are related to access? I don't have that information in front of me, but I certainly, uh, we could work to get that. Um, I would, you know, uh, wanna say that under COVID-19 circumstance, this is something that um, we have seen um, uh, as um, uh, a challenge because people are concerned about their safety and so forth. Um, and we are um, being more sensitive to the climate that we're in now if we weren't under COVID-19, um, you know, pandemic emergency. I mean, and this was particularly telling um, in the months of end of March and uh, throughout April when we've seen um, a big dip 
in mold repair uh, requests that were coming in. Um, and, uh, and then we've seen a, you know, a, a steady incline to um, uh, now uh, uh, residents being a, a lot more willing to have us there. Um, so, but we certainly will work to uh, get the access rate uh, data for you. Right. And Elena, I, I, I would, you know, just from looking at the reports um, and, and from the report from Stout and our internal reports, um, I mean, certainly uh, the fact that we're doing more uh, communication to our residents and we're reaching out to them in advance of sending out uh, the super or the assistant super for the initial inspection. And we're discussing with them the process. I, I think that those communications have greatly improved our access rate. Uh, some of the challenges that we still have are where we need to access another unit in order to make a correction. Right? And um, as we have done in the past with other repairs of this type, um, if we need to exercise our right of entry in order to correct a condition uh, that is impacting another unit, um, we stand ready to do, to do that. Right. Um, I, I would like just to take a, a quick opportunity. Um, when Council Member Torres asked me if I believe that we have the capacity uh, to um, uh, to complete the roof installations by the end of year. Um, and I had said yes. Uh, I, I just want to state that we have been aggressively working to bring on additional contractors. Um, we hope to um, have three additional uh, contractors on board uh, as early as next week uh, to perform roof installations. Um, and we will continue to bring additional contractors on because I want um, additional bandwidth. Um, I do believe that the progress that we have made is putting us on track uh, to complete the roof installations um, as we had um, as we had said we would. Um, are we currently at the capacity to install a thousand a month? Uh, we're not, but we're working towards that goal. And I do believe with the efforts that and this has been an, an agency-wide um, initiative. Um, absolutely every part of the authority has been working on this. This is one of our highest priorities. Um, and, and, and I do believe that we will um, achieve that. Uh, and we will reset that um, as we move along, as we start to do additional installations, um, as we start to bring on additional contractors, um, we will make adjust, adjustments as necessary. Uh, we'll continue to uh, be transparent about where we are in the process. Um, and, and, you know, the chair and I have had uh, many conversations um, with respect to this particular issue. And we have been open and honest about where we are in the process and, and where we believe we will be. Um, and we will make adjustments as we move along. So because, you know, right now we see the numbers increasing, um, the COVID numbers increasing throughout the city. The COVID pandemic has impacted the goals and the deadlines that were set out in the hud NYCHA agreement. Um, are you seeking to move the deadlines and, um, you know, what, what kind of changes are you looking to make um, related to the agreement and just kind of assessing um, what happened in the spring and in the summer and where we are today. No, thank you, Council Member. And, and certainly <clears throat> the impact of the pandemic um, has been widespread. <clears throat> and it's impacted not just us, but the entire city. Uh, I am going to ask Dan Green, um, our Chief Compliance Officer, uh, to answer that question. Uh, sure, and thank you so much for that opportunity and, uh, and thank you for allowing me to speak today. Uh, first of all, back earlier in the year, NYCHA did uh, declare what they call force majeure under the agreement. So we, we basically, because of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the national disaster, were unable to comply with certain deadlines. That, that was said to the monitor and to our federal regulators. Uh, they agreed that it was a force majeure condition because the pandemic was beyond NYCHA's control. And so now NYCHA is going to have to um, is going to have to uh, work with the monitor and with the federal stakeholders to to reevaluate some of the deadlines, most certainly under the action plans and maybe under the agreement itself. Uh, I will say the monitor is holding us to a very uh, tight standard. Uh, they want to see to make sure that we're using our best faith best faith efforts to comply 
with the uh, agreement, even under these very uh, unexpected circumstances. And so um, we're continuing to discuss with them on each of the pillars, lead, mold, heat, um, FAS, uh, how the pandemic is impacting those deadlines and what would be more reasonable deadlines or what are reasonable but aggressive deadlines in light of the pandemic. So those conversations are ongoing, out evolving. I think this lasted a lot longer than anybody expected. Uh, so I think that uh, as uh, once once we kind of get to a point where the pandemic has stopped affecting our operations, we'll be able to come up with those deadlines. But I want to just be clear: every day we're working towards those deadlines as if we as if we could meet them. Um, but for some sometimes we're just not able to because of the impact that it's having to our operations. And the monitor is holding our feet to the fire on, on the on, on our commitments under the agreement. Okay, so. Um related to the impact of you know COVID on just operations and the agreement itself, um, what are the cost implications that are associated with the implementation of the of the actual action plan that was adopted? So what are like just you know talking about the operational stuff, but what are the, the cost implications and what is the estimate? I'm just trying to get a clarity. Um, I know my colleague asked was asking this question, but what is the estimated total cost to abate all the mold work orders across the portfolio now. So that I'm, I'm gonna kick it back to Elena on that, on that point. Um, but I, I would say that uh, we can give like an assessment of what the action plan, what the, what the funding commitments were under the action plan. I don't know if we have a cost of how much it will, will take to address all of the open mold work orders. But Elena, do you, do you wanna give an answer to that on the, on the costs? Um, uh, sure. So uh, on the ventilation side, uh, we are, uh, 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 we've committed $50 million over the three years between 2020 to 2022. Um, uh, there's been an investment of $16 million um, this year alone uh, in increasing the contract capacity. Um, Four of a million, which was allocated to Office of Mold Assessment and Remediation. We also have um, uh, uh, approximately uh, 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 2.5, I'll, I'll need to circle back the exact number, but we have um, uh, additional uh, funding that is allocated um, mm -hmm. just you know, for the mold uh, assessment and remediation contracts that we uh, 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 execute and administer. Um, in addition, uh, we're in process of um, uh, awarding uh, a job contract, two job contracts, which are five million each a year uh, for the uh, leaks. So there, there's been um, notable, um, certainly, uh, financial commitments that uh, NYCHA has uh, invested in um, uh, in order to comply. But I don't have a lump sum that uh, gives the aggregated uh, budget associated with um, the, 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 the principles at this point. And, and if I can, Council Member, just go back to what, uh, a number that I had um, provided earlier. Um, when you just look at, at the, our capital need uh, to replace our plumbing systems in 110,000 units, uh, and again, what we've done is we've taken out the developments that are scheduled for PACT and RAD. We need $9.5 billion just to do the plumbing work. Right? And, and you know, to your question about how COVID has impacted us, um, you know, just the disinfecting of, of our buildings, um, it, it, the, the cost to the authority was approximately $30 million over six months. Um, and as we implement the ever-changing guidances that are issued um, by the city and the state um, and, the, and the federal government, um, and how to perform work in units, costs will increase. Uh, you know, part of the, the roof fan replacement work is also to go into every apartment and to vacuum clean the lateral vents and to replace the dampers. We've got to get into, we have to get into every apartment. And, and it's not like it used to be in the past. Before we go into an apartment, we have to make sure that our staff have the proper PPE equipment, that we're providing our residents with proper PPE equipment if they don't have it um, when we walk into the apartment. Um, and work is going to uh, take longer and be more costly um, as we need to implement uh, the guidances that are issued, 
would perform his work inside of apartments. Um, so the pandemic has had widespread effects, uh, not just on our ability to uh, correct mold conditions, but for all repairs. And I, in, I totally understand that, which is why I was asking the series of questions related to out of this universe of the, this number of repairs that um, have been called in that are not yet completed, how many of them are associated with um, no access into the units? And then, you know, tying that back to um, what does that actually mean? Distilling it down to, you know, is it the resident that, you know, would like to have some protections? And, you know, is it the staff? And what would it cost to, you know, make sure that you have what you need in order to go in? Because remember, I had a constituent who um, we all know, you know, after countless videos um, that Ms. Collins um, posted to the public um, of her mold situations, there was a need to, to relocate her and her son. Um, and it took a lot of movement, moving parts to be able to make that happen during the pandemic. No, and I, I, agree. I know that that was that one constituent, but multiply multiply that by, you know, we're looking talking about nine fifteen thousand orders that work orders that came in, and you know nine thousand that have not been completed yet. Um, you know what does that look like? And that's what we were trying. And so now we're talking about you know oh it is difficult. It's going to cause this, and we're trying to figure out what does it look like in order to you know, push in, in different places and, and know that you have the data, you know, readily available to press play when it's time to, to move forward, especially with, you know, Council Member Torres heading to Congress. <laughs> yes. Soon, right? and, and we, yeah, and we certainly would, would um, welcome the opportunity to have further conversations um, after this hearing um, on these issues um, where we can do um, more thorough um, analysis of the data that we have. And, and certainly the case that you mentioned and, and other cases, um, I, again, I'm, I wanna go back to in my testimony, we talked about the collaboration um, that exists today that we didn't have before. Um, we have the ombudsperson, we have the special master, we have OCC, we have the federal monitor, we have our internal compliance department, QA, H and S, and we have OMAR. These are entities that did not exist um, in, in addressing these types of conditions before. And I have to say that the collaboration and the, the, uh, the communication between these groups um, ha is really starting to show its, its full effect. Right? And yes, we, w when cases like, like uh, those serious cases are brought to our attention, we now have a platform. We have now the ability uh, to address them. Uh, whereas before we... Honestly, um, <clears throat> we struggled with that. And so I do want to say that um, that the the platform that we currently have in addressing mold is is uh, something that we did not have in the past. I think this is the right step forward. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, Dan and his team um, have done incredible work um, with respect to mold. The monitor continues to contribute, um, and, and I believe that we have uh, ongoing. Uh, conversations with with the monitor on a weekly basis, if, um, specifically on, on mold related issues. Um, and it really has opened up um, our eyes and, and opened up new opportunities for us. So I would say that the collaboration and the communication um, that we have is, is what has been long needed. Okay. Um, so in your testimony, you talked about under the mold busters, um, just a new training where it states our staff received new enhanced mold assessment and remediation training through eight hours of classroom training and so on and so on and so on. Um, so <clears throat> who does NYCHA hire to perform <clears throat> mold abatement in the apartments and how many mold complaints um, can be abated per day? And, you know, clearly this is just getting, you know, again, the sense of, of who's doing the work in the apartments, um, you know, uh, what's the percentage of staffers that have been um, trained or not trained that are still in need of training and, you know, who's, who's doing the work? 
Certainly. I'm going to ask Elena to to right. uh, respond to that. Yes, so thank has... you. Great. Happy to. Thank you very much for the question. Um, so um, the mobile, uh, to answer the first question is who do we hire? Um, when it comes down to contractors, we hire um, uh, uh, contractors that have licenses to remediate mold from the state. Um, and to us, uh, assess. And uh, as you may know, um, by the regulations, the assessor has to be separate from the entity that is remediating it. Um, so that is part of the minimum requirements for a contract. When it comes down to the staff that is uh, doing the work, um, it depends on the square footage of mold. So if it's uh, less than 10 square feet, caretaker X is responsible. So on the property management side, uh, to uh, remediate the mold. If it's between um, 10 to 99 square feet, this would What is that? Can you just some, can explain what's, what's 10 square, 10 square feet, feet of mold? Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, as part of the inspection process, um, the inspector is required to assess how many square footage of mold uh, is in the component or area uh, and record that as part of the inspection. So that gets recorded. Um, on um, the uh, room level, and um, then uh, that feeds into the remediation plan. Um, and that's also internally how we uh, distribute who is going to be doing the work, right? So um, if it, again, if it's less than 10 square feet of mold, uh, then it would fall on the property management staff and caretaker X. Uh, if it's between 10, to 99, it would fall under our skilled trades, um, or uh, I should say uh, painters, in title of painters. And um, if it's above 100 uh, square feet, this is co considered a large uh, a job. Um, and um, uh, there, uh, that's a specific criteria because additional steps are required uh, in order to ensure, uh, you know, proper uh, safety uh, uh, measures are taking place when doing this work. Um, and that is currently falls under lead hazard control. Um, this of course represents a small unit and uh, universe and which is uh, also typically the most common work that we do with the contracts that we administer. So like really complex jobs, uh, a lot of times those that are, are within that 100 square feet uh, or higher, you know, uh, require significant work, as you could imagine. Um, uh, so um, then uh, how are we training our staff? That was another question, right? Um, yeah, so but going back to um, 10 feet, uh, 10 square feet of mold and 10 to 100 and then above 100, just walking into the average NYCHA apartment um, bathroom, what what's 10 square feet? Or, the, or a living room or a kitchen, what's 10 square feet? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, uh, the I, I don't know how to <laughs> quantify. I mean, you would, uh, uh, I think that the easiest ways you could do it is by looking at uh, uh, a paper, right? I mean, all of our staff that is doing this uh, are required to take measurements on as part of their regular basis and it's not only tied to mold. Um, Can I, somebody give me like a simple answer to that? And I'm saying that because, you know, just a regular person just wanting to know somebody coming into their home and you have a, you know, you don't have a skilled trade, you have a maintenance worker coming in there to deal with the mold and not understanding that, you know, because it's not, because it's less than a hundred square feet then this maintenance person can do this. We'll go into you know, how they're able to do that, but just to get a sense of a picture of what does 10 square feet look like so that you know, folks can understand. Uh, uh, this is Rasul Azanija. So you know, uh, during an inspection, when a person goes, let's say there is some mold on the tile in the bathroom and he's looking at it and he said, okay, this area is three feet by three feet it's about less than 10 square feet. So that become a definition for a square footage of the, of the mold. Also in the, in the class, they have been trained. People who are doing an inspection, they've been trained. We, we have trained over 2000 
870 people in three different areas of the, of the class that we, we did those training through uh, environmental education is the entity which is certified to do this type of training. We did an inspection training with building science training and we did remediation method training through uh, this is school for all 2,870 people. And basically they train them in the class how to measure the affected area and how to, <clears throat> how to explain what cause of it, how to do, use the tools that they given you, uh, moisture meter or anemometer or uh, hydrometer to measure the, the effect of the wet walls for moisture problem. So those are the way they have trained them to do this in inspection. As you say, they can categorize, you know, is it less than 10 square feet or is it something between 10 square feet and 100 square feet? And that's how a state department or labor define the mold situation too. So if it's less, so if it's 10 square feet, who goes in again? If it's less than 10 square feet, uh, the care, caretaker X. Caretaker X. Which right. would be categorized as a simple repair? Right. Mold. Yes. yes. Even if even if it's 10, 10 square feet of mold, because right. of the size of it, would be labeled as simple, right? Simple. Well, I mean, Elena and Brazil, please correct me if I if I'm incorrect on this, but it's not just the square footage, but also the work that is required to address the mm -hmm. underlying condition. Right, so there Correct. are a number of factors that go into what it Correct. constitutes a simple versus a complex repair. So you might have a small uh, square foot uh, area that's impacted, but the Correct. repair might require, you know, bringing in plumbers and electricians and plasters and asbestos abatement workers. That's a complex repair. That's correct. Yeah. So, okay, so let's go through the steps. So when the person calls in about mold, Someone goes in and does an assessment. Correct. They look at the size of it, but then that same person that's looking at the size of it, if it is nine square feet, that same person that determines this is nine square feet will then also be the person who determines what the source is. Yes. Correct. So, and council member, if I, if I may, so it's not just a person that we send, um, so the person that, that performs the initial inspection is either the superintendent, an assistant superintendent, or the property manager. So right. these, are, these are high level uh, skilled trade, uh, skilled workers that make the initial assessment. Now, now, the initial assessment might not always identify what the underlying source is. And again, it may require that we come in then and open up a wall or a ceiling to identify where the moisture is coming from but they're equipped with all of the technology of the new equipment that we went out and purchased to help make a better determination. So they have the moisture meters, they have the meters that measure humidity. Uh, we have boroscopes. This is all equipment that we did not use in the past um, when um, addressing a mold uh, work order. Um, so it, it's, you know, I like to call it the three T's as Elena has uh, used before. So we have we have new tools, new technology, and and training um, that we have um, that have gone into the Mold Busters program, right? and all of this has been developed um, in conjunction with the special master um, and the ombuds person uh, and the federal monitor. Uh, so they are partners with us in every step of the process, and we continue to improve on it. Um, so, so do you we, have a one hundred percent of the NYCHA staffers? Um, who are supposed to be trained, are they all trained on how to perform this task? I, um, I don't, Elena, do you know if, if, yeah, yeah, if sure. they all have? It. So the, um, as um, you could imagine, um, from when we rolled out uh, a year ago, a little over a year ago, we're actually um, at a little over uh, 13 months of anniversary of the Mold Busters program rolling out. Um, you know, we trained the uh, assistant super, uh, supers um, and property managers, uh, among other um, uh, titles, um, to, to uh, make sure to be able to do this. 
But you can imagine that between then and now, we may have promoted people, right? And uh, 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 additional uh, training is required. Uh, what is built in into our model is that as new people come on board, we do train them. Um, right now, we're, um, we had to unfortunately put the training on hold during COVID to um, potentially work on the curriculum to be under social distancing um, requirements. And we resumed uh, the training already um, with those circumstances and requirements in place. Uh, and we have about over 600 uh, folks that we're going to be retraining. And that's not just um, the inspectors, but that also includes other titles such as, you know, maintenance workers. So what's the, percent what's the percentage of staffers that have to still be trained? Uh, out of which titles? That haven't so, received the training? Is that is that the question that you, you're uh, interested in finding? I don't want to say that have not received the training. I would say that need to receive the training because if we say that have not received the training, that could be a play on words because some training has been done. And, you know, now with the COVID, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, new policies and, and procedures, um, you know, that like that turns into something else. And so the this question is... is this is Russell. Of the 2,911 people who were supposed to be trained. The 2,000? 2,911 people. Okay. That, these are the staff that we said they have to have this training. Mm -hmm. 2,870 of them were trained. So almost everybody's been trained. Exactly. So everybody's ready to go. All the Into people the apartments. That all the people that they needed to be trained, they were trained, exception okay. of a few people who, who either left us or, and any new train, any new coming people, they, they will go through the same train. Okay, okay. So how many complaints can be abated per day? Is there, can you determine that? Give us a sense of what that number, what that looks like now. Uh, Councilman, we're, we're gonna have to get get back to you on that answer okay it's not it's not a simple response um, oh. would you say how many can be abated can, like uh, categories can you say that you know um i mean that that is the, the general question but is there a way you can answer it based on different categories can you say that um well we we are able to abate this type of mold complaint in this you know within this particular square footage if there is no blah, blah, blah. If, if, if we don't have to bust a wall, we can do this amount per day based on the 2,870 people that had the training that was required to be able to go in and do assessments and know about the different tools and could continue, continue down this pipeline. So I, I, I certainly think we need to have a, a further conversation. Um, and get some clarification on exactly what you're looking for. Again, this this program has been capturing um, a tremendous amount of data, right? And and we also need to make sure that we're s staying within compliance of the terms of the um, of of the the agreement. Um, and so, why don't we have a conversation um, later about what information is it that you're exactly looking for? Um, we can tell you how many. Um, inspections have been performed, what we think we need to um, to keep on that on track. Uh, and then with respect to repairs, we're using a combination of both in-house staff as well as contracted staff. Um, so it kind of varies depending on um, the questions that are being asked. Um, I will say though that uh, Dan Green and Razul and I have been talking about um, reaching out to our partners and, and and seeing if, if we can expand on the titles uh, that currently we use to do these inspections. Um, our supers and property managers and assistant supers have a tremendous um, burden. You know, the, um, you know, they work um, on a number of different issues every day. Um, I would like to, um, for us to entertain um, introducing other titles so we can have a, a deeper bench of staff that can perform additional inspections. And we hope to um, have a conversation along that line with the special master and with the uh, monitor and see if they agree with us so that we can work together in identifying 
um, additional staff that we can train. Uh, because again, the more people that we have that are um, trained and, and able to perform inspections, uh, I think the, the better we can do uh, in addressing the mold problem. Okay. Um, I asked that question because I was still trying to get a sense of the repairs that are in progress and trying to figure out again, if there's some type of categories. And I asked a question about um, the types, like the, the, like who's going into the apartments to get a sense of when you mentioned the the caretakers can, the caretaker X can go in and do if it's less than uh, 10 square feet and then it's the skilled trades and then it's somebody else after a hundred square feet. And then I asked the question about um, how many repairs or abatements can be done within the day based on the different categories to again, get an understanding of this number that we have and how do you complete that number in the middle of a pandemic? And the fact that we know that families are living in overcrowded conditions, they're in closed spaces, there's poor ventilation. In order to have a conversation and give the folks that live in New York City Housing Authority some hope. That's why I'm asking that question. And I thought it was pretty simple. I didn't think it was a complicated question, but it seems that every time we ask a question, it turns into something that's unnecessarily complicated. Well, and it's just... I, I would say that mold um, is a complicated issue and there is no simple answer. Uh, and as you mentioned, when you add in, but it can all be, the other... but it can't, but it can be because it's about how do you communicate your problems in order to be able to figure out how to come up with solutions to the problems. And so if you are explaining something and you're exacerbated about the fact that it's complicated, it's going to continue to be complicated. But if we make something as simple as when you go into your home and it should be a place that is healthy and safe for you to live for you to breathe, we should figure out simple ways to address it. And if you like, and if it's so, it's so I understand it can be complicated because you have so many different moving parts and so many different people, but just because something sounds complicated, there's always a simple way to be able to communicate what's going on and address it. Just even down to me asking a question about what is 10 square feet? When you walk into an apartment from the front door, do you put one foot step one foot in front of the other? If do we count 10 steps and that's 10 square feet? I'm just trying to, and I'm not asking for the staffers to know what the heck is 10 square feet. I ask that question because there's the, the public is 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 on this hearing. They want to know what's going on, and I want to be able to articulate to them what the heck 10 square feet is so that they can know that they have a caretaker X going into their apartment because we hear those complaints. The person that's coming to my apartment to fix my mold is not skilled, they don't know what they're doing. And I want them to know what the heck, I wanna be able to articulate. This is what's going on in your apartment as it relates to mold. That's to me, that's simple. Yeah. But that answer that I got from three different people was complicated as hell. I um, just wanna know what the heck was 10 square feet. Yeah, Chair, uh, I, I, I really I appreciate that. Um, I, I, I do wanna know that part of the process uh, when an inspection is conducted, um, the person conducting the inspection, according to our standard procedure, is required to explain uh, what the findings are, what that means, what the remediation plan looks like. Um, you know, we issue um, a, a mold inspection receipt. Uh, we also do, um, as you know, and we send a mailer that outlines what that looks like. Um, we uh, also um, uh, are enhancing our campaign right now. We secured a vendor uh, in order to help us, um, you know, further enhance our communication with the tenants uh, and our uh, residents and families. And we're engaging various partners um, in this dialogue so that way we could incorporate um, that type of feedback. And I really appreciate it, right? It's like, and, and I will take that back 
We're having conversations right now. And I think that it would be helpful to include visuals of what does that mean 10 square feet? What does it mean, you know, something that is com uh, considered a really extreme job, a uh, complex job. So I, I will take that feedback back. Uh, I will take it back to the working group and our vendors and we'll build that in um, um, as, as something for, you know, to further elaborate on um, as we further build out our communication to our tenants around the subject. Okay, I would just, I, I'm told I need to bring it down a notch. Okay. <laughs> um, um, Okay, can you just um, can you just talk to us about just proactive measures that you're taking, um, not responding to the work orders themselves, but what is NYCHA doing, like just proactively, and, and not the response to, again, the work orders, but proactively to to uh, to address um, everything that we've been talking about, all of the complaints. Um, in this climate, what we're facing right now with the uptick in numbers, sure. COVID um, numbers. So I would like to just start and then I'm gonna ask uh, Dan to, to join me. Um, I think there's probably no better example of what we're doing proactively than the roof end replacement. Um, and and by, by upgrading the roof ends, uh, and not replacing the roof ends in kind um, is a is a proactive measure, um, and it will, um, you know, and it was not required of us, um, but we have made <laughs> um, a commitment to it and, and an investment. Um, there certainly has been um, a tremendous effort given to educating our residents and and. Uh, providing them with information about the program, um, and and we continue to to build on that. Right, um, we want to be as open and as transparent um, as we um, should be with our residents and with the public in general. Right, and um, so and, and you know, Dan, if you could talk uh, too about the collaboration, especially with respect to the OCC. Uh, because I think that that has been um, a tremendous step in the right in the, in the right direction, and in communicating to our residents, answering their questions, um, addressing their concerns, um, and I think that that has really kind of proven itself to be um, extremely successful. But Dan, if you could talk a little bit more too about um, OCC and the collaboration that we have with them. Sure, sure. And, and uh, sorry, I got knocked off for a few minutes there. My computer uh, cut out. So uh, the first thing I just want to say on proactive uh, work is, is data. Um, the the independent data analyst that was uh, that was retained uh, through the through the bias consent decree does a tremendous amount of work to proactively identify uh, a lot of different issues. The developments that need uh, the most attention, the floors that need the most attention. Uh, they also identify employees who uh, who don't seem to be following the protocols, uh, running through and, and doing uh, doing inspections too quickly, not entering required information in work orders. So all that proactive analysis that's being done uh, by the independent data analyst is fed to a number of different teams that go out and use it to try to enforce compliance. Uh, and and uh, we've done that over the past year. We're doing it more and more, uh, but but. Uh, that, that's one way that we're going to be proactive. Uh, the good thing about the new system is that everything is tracked in max. So nobody's going to get away with doing uh, a work order that does not meet the requirements that we put in the buy and consent decree. Uh, and if they do, we're going to catch them. We, um, we, we compliant, the federal monitor, and the, uh, and the court appointed experts review a tremendous number of work orders every single month uh, to see if they are following those protocols. But if they're not, we're going to investigate it and make sure that those employees are going to be held accountable. And that's one way that we can be proactive is by going out there and enforcing these procedures with our with our workforce, so that they're bringing the proper equipment, they're entering the proper meetings, they're creating the appropriate child orders, they're meeting the timelines, which clearly now that they are not. Um, so that that's one example. The other thing that we in compliance are going to do to be proactive 
Um, we're going to stay on top of the uh, timelines for inspections. That's one of the big things that we've been doing. Uh, every single month, we review delinquent inspections. And then immediately, if, if we see those inspections as delinquent, we send uh, communications to the RAM to make sure that they are, uh, to our regional asset managers, to make sure that they are getting those inspections scheduled and done properly in their portfolio. Another proactive tool that I, I want to talk about is on-site monitoring, uh, which is really the bedrock of it. And it's going to take a few, a little while, uh, you know, to get to get the, to start to see the benefit of it. But we are going out every two weeks and doing a deep review of our highest risk development in compliance. And we're taking our EHS partners, our quality assurance of partner, partners. And one of those issues that we look at at every single development that we go on site is how they're complying with mold. Um, Cause that's one of our bedrock issues. Uh, so what we do is a full assessment of what their what their work orders are showing, whether they're following the procedures, and if they're not following those procedures, we put them under a corrective action, and we uh, can get them training. We we hold them accountable, uh, including supervisory staff, to make sure that they are to make sure they understand that this is not the old NYCHA. This is a new NYCHA, and you're not going to get away with uh, with putting uh, work orders in the system that are garbage. Uh, and we will make examples of employees uh, who who do that. Uh, and, uh, and we also will go and reinspect units that are not done properly um, because this is a new era for NYCHA uh, in terms of employee accountability, in terms of giving better quality work and following what we wrote down. We invested a tremendous amount of money and resources to procedure manuals. They need to be followed. Uh, we can't just have people blowing these off. Um, these were developed by people with scientific backgrounds, technical experts. They need to be followed and adhered to. Are all our employees following the training today? No, but that's what we're here to do. And that is, I think, proactive enforcement. Um, and, and that, all, again, I wanna go back to that data tool. Um, the data tools that we're doing is allowing us to identify trends uh, for our workers who are not doing this appropriately. And uh, it's not just one or two work orders, uh, but a lot of work orders. We're gonna come out and target those developments. And we're gonna make sure those employees understand that this is not um, the night of the past. Thank you so much, Daniel. I, I, I appreciate that. I, I do. Um, Councilmember Torres, I apologize. I didn't realize you um, you had more questions. So Councilmember Torres. I'm starts now. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I just have a few questions for the general manager. Um, in our earlier exchange, you seem to, uh, you seem to dispute the, the number three, um, that NYCHA only installed three roof fans. So, I just want clarity, how many roof fans has NYCHA installed so far? So, so as part of since 2018, we have installed 1,600 and, I'm sorry. Do you want me to take that veto? I'm sorry, since, so I, I, I can't, yeah, um, Elena, just give me one second and then I'll hand off. Um, so since 2018, when we began the inspections of the roof ends, we replaced 1,661. Right. And then towards the goal of the 1,669, which we are, um, that's the goal for the end of year, right, we have installed 181 uh, to date. Elena, please um, go ahead. I'm sorry, what's the difference between the 1,661 and the 181? So the 1,661 are the total number of roof fans that have been replaced as a result of the inspections performed since 2018. The 181 is a subset of that, um, but it's, it's um, those are roof fans that were in the, would have been replaced in the first phase. Right, Elena, do you wanna? And all yeah. of these are replacing the mechanical ventilation system. Correct. Replacing the roof ends. Okay. Right, Elena, is that my, or my numbers accurate? Correct. That's correct. Yeah. The, you, you brought up the chair strategic plan, the blueprint for change, uh, which envisions the creation of a housing trust. Um, would the housing trust be subject to the mold agreement and the HUD SDNY consent decree? Uh, yes, it is. Um, Dan, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but of course it would be. Yes. Yes. Okay. And so you would see to it that, that it would be? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay. okay. That's good. 
Um, under the bias reports, the housing authority is required to produce, my understanding is the housing authority is required to produce quarterly reports about mold and leaks. Uh, is the housing authority willing to share those reports with the city council and the public housing committee? Hello? Yeah, sorry. So um, which quarterly reports are you referencing? Uh, my understanding, if I'm wrong, but if but my understanding is that under the Baez agreement, the housing authority is required to produce quarterly reports about leaks and mold. Um, if those reports do exist, or is the housing authority willing to share it with the public housing committee and the New York City Council? So yeah, um, Dan, are you are you? Um aware of which reports the council member is referring to? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I would need, you know, I would are need to speak to- it's it's Yes or no, willing to share the reports? Yes, no, or you don't know yet? Well, uh, I wanna make I, sure that we have the reports. We do We do have the report. Yes, we do have the reports. Uh, we need to speak to our legal department, but I would say, yeah, we wanna be transparent here. So I, I don't okay. see a problem with that. Okay. Um, I, I, I had asked, um, Vito, I had asked you earlier whether NYCHA presently had the capacity to, to achieve, to install more than a thousand roof fans. You originally said yes, or you believe that the housing authority did. You then revised the statement and acknowledge you, that you don't presently have the capacity. I want to revisit another statement you made. You, you seem to deny that there was a relationship between ventilation and coronavirus transmission. The chair clearly read a statement from the CDC demonstrating a relationship between the two, affirming a relationship between the two. like. Does the Housing Authority want to revise its position on the relationship between coronavirus transmission and ventilation? No, sir, what I want to clarify is that I am not a medical expert or a scientific expert. Uh, so, and, and I don't believe that the statement that the chair read um, was referring to roof fans. I believe that it was referring to um, HVAC systems. Right? So I certainly would welcome an opportunity to speak with um, experts in this field and to hear what they have to say. So I just want to be clear, the position of the housing authority is that there is no relationship between, Time expired. between ventilation and coronavirus transmission. I just want to be clear about that. I think that there are a number of external factors that contribute to, uh, to the spread of coronavirus. <clears throat> I have not personally seen um, any reports that directly tied um, inadequate roof fans or ventilation in bathrooms to the spread of coronavirus. Okay. Coronavirus. If you could tell me that there are reports that, that specifically tie back to roof fans and, and adequate ventilation in bathrooms, um, I'll be more than glad to, to take a look at it. And, and, and uh, I'll be more than glad if, to I, say if I could just fit in a quick, I know NYCHA has access to a mold expert um, I think it's microecologies uh, under the agreement. I'm curious, has there any, have there been any conversations between the mold consultant and the housing authority regarding the relationship between ventilation and transmission? Um, I can't answer that question, sir. I have not been party to any of those conversations. I don't know if there will have been. Is, we've seen the analysis from Greg Smith. Is the housing authority willing to do its own analysis to see if there's a relationship between the mechanical ventilation systems on the one hand and the infection rate, the morbidity rate, the mortality rate of COVID-19 on the other hand, are you willing to do your own analysis to determine if there is in fact a relationship? We're willing to work with the healthcare providers, uh, the healthcare experts with our uh, city department of health and the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation. Um, I don't know if that's an answer to my, are you willing to do an analysis? I don't like, are, I, I, are we willing to take on the analysis on our own? No, no, I would, no, not on your own, but are you willing, whether it's in partnership with experts, are you willing to see, to examine whether the developments that have the highest rate of infection, morbidity and mortality when it comes to COVID-19, whether those developments have a mechanical ventilation system and whether there's a relationship between those two variables. Are you willing we will to- We will certainly that? reach out to, to our, our partners in the health department okay. and HHC. Because here's my concern. I am convinced that there is a relationship. I think most people are convinced that there's a relationship. And if you believe as I do, that ventilated apartments 
poorly ventilated apartments are a petri dish for the coronavirus, right? Then installing the roof fans becomes a public health emergency. There's a greater sense of urgency because it's no longer just about eradicating mold, it's about protecting people's lives from COVID-19. But if you feel there's no relationship between the two, then it's just one initiative among many. There's no sense of urgency, there's no sense of emergency. And I think that's the disconnect between the housing authority and, and those of us, which I think is most of us, who believe that poorly ventilated apartments is a factor in coronavirus transmission. So, well, um, I don't believe that there is a disconnect at all, sir. And I think that we share the same um, concerns and the same goals. And we do take mold um, extremely seriously. Um, I can't answer your questions. Um, you know, I think that we, we need to speak with our partners uh, in, the health, uh, in the health professions. Uh, we've been following the guidances that have been issued at the, by the city, state, and federal um, entities. Um, and you know, I want to reference back to, you seem to be suggesting that our roof fans don't work, right? They work. And in August, 98% of the roof fans that were um, inspected I'm not, I'm, were I'm not working. I'm not suggesting. Sorry, sorry, I, let me, but, let me, let me but finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Ben, sure, I'm the one asking the question. Go ahead. The city reported that in microecologies found in one building in Millbrooks that four out of five of the roof fans were not working. And that many of your roof fans are clogged with decades of dust and debris. That's not my opinion. That, that has been reported independently by the city and by microecologies. And, I, and again, I, I think, sir, that there's also confusion between the purpose of the roof fan and an HVAC system um, or, or, um, or adequate ventilation. I certainly will have reach out to our partners um, in, uh, at the health department and, and have that conversation with them. Uh, I'll end on that. Just no, I just want to be clear. Microecologies has concluded that installing roof fans would reduce mold growth by 50% in public housing, by as much as 50% in public housing. So from the standpoint of microecologies, you know, roof fans is a critical piece of the solution. Um, but I don't want to, I don't want to belabor the point. I, I appreciate right, your you. answers to the question. Okay, I, I was still sitting here trying to figure out, um, will the roof fans clear out all of the dust that's in the, I don't wanna say ventilation systems, I'm, I'm, you know, layman's terms, when you walk into a bathroom in a NYCHA apartment, and when you look up and it is clogged with layers and layers and layers and layers and layers and layers and layers, and layers, and layers of dust. How do you correct that? So, so the, um, there's actually two parts to this initiative. One part is to replace the roof fan. And, and as I mentioned earlier, um, we're not replacing them in kind. We're actually installing uh, a roof fan that has uh, a greater capacity. Um, and the second part of it is to actually go into each unit and to um, clean out the lateral um, vents uh, the ductwork and, and to replace the damper. So it's a two-step process. And, and Alina, I'm going to ask, um, please, to jump in. But if I'm not mistaken, where we have already replaced the roof fans with a the fans with a greater capacity, we have already seen uh, improvement in the air exchange. Right? Yeah, we've flow. we've kind of like you know beat that into the ground with the roofing piece. Let's. Let's start from the ladder, walk into a bathroom. You see these layers and layers and layers and layers and layers and layers and layers, and layers, and layers of dust. You know, I, if I may, uh, just brother. quickly explain. How do you yeah, clear so, that? so you walk in, you open up the grill, you use a HEPA vac, you suction the dust out. That's the lateral cleaning, that's part of the scope. And then you reinstall the grill and a fire damper. So it's, it's a pretty simple process, actually. So are we doing that? Yes, it's part of the scope. So how, how, how many units needed that? And how many have been completed? And how so, many? So is... the intent is to do that in every apartment. So where are you with that? 
I don't believe that that part of the initiative has started yet. Yeah, and it hasn't started. But if I may, Vito, every time there is a complaint now, the automated mobusters process makes us take a, a a reading at the grill, and if it's clogged, then the the workers required to clean it out. So, at the at the work order level, uh, when there's a complaint and the suction is not functioning, um, the CS the CFF is not correct. Um, then the worker is required to open that grill and perform the uh, process that I just described. And in addition, it automatically uh, creates a, a, a work order to inspect the roof fan to make sure that the roof fan is operable. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. You, because that's a, that's a series, that's a complaint that I get a lot. And when I go into, I want to say damn that everybody apartment, I see that. And so when we're talking about contributing factors and, um, you're just different things that exacerbate respiratory issues. You know, clearly, when we're not talking about mold, we're also talking about dust and, um, you know, and, and just, again, things that exacerbate. Right. So yeah, and I'm, gonna and, ask, I'm gonna ask my team, and, and Vlada, Elena, Razul, um, could someone in, in a simple, in simple terms explain what the purpose of a roof fan is? Because I think that there's still some confusion it's not, it doesn't provide for a, an exchange of air. It's not a ventilation system, right? Um, and I, I think it would be helpful if we explained what a roof fan does and how it works. So I'm going to open it up to, to you know, Vlada or Elena or Razul. Right, so, Vito, oh. are you saying that the, there's a need to explain? Uh, so I'm not really talking about having a system and, you know, thing, something is like, flying out of this particular vent or this space inside of the bathroom. I'm talking about the fact that it's just years and years and years and years and years of, of, of compiled like dust and debris in no, this I, particular, I so uh, in the mold, right? Um, right? So I'm just trying to fix, so I'm just trying to figure out is, you know, you work from the outside, but then, you know, you talked about this other two-step process where you also work from the inside. And then you also mentioned that that is something where they go in and assess um, to see if there's a clog, right? But just from just the visual, like when you walk in, you see it, you see something there. And so I'm just trying to get an understanding of, you know, are we doing something about that as well? But it sounds like that's the, that it's that, you know, do you not think that's an issue? So no, that, so, uh, that is an issue. Yeah. That is an issue and uh, is part of the contract. Once we replace these roof fans, to go to every apartment that each fan, let's say, provide five or six apartment ventilation. So what the fan does is, is exhausting the air inside the bathroom to the outside. That's all it does. It pulls the air. And as part of the contract, once we replace this roof fan, we go back and, as Velada was saying, we clean the register, we take it out, Usually the horizontal uh, part of the, the docking is only one foot from the vertical one. So we have a vacuum the, inside the dock and then put the new fireproof and damper and put new register in there. So it is part of the contract to do this work. Right, so it is part of the, so it is part of the process. It is included in the contracts that we have for the installation of the roof fans. In addition to which, again, because I, I, as I had mentioned earlier, we would like uh, to expand our bandwidth. Uh, so we're also looking to put out very specific contracts um, for the in-unit work that's required, which is the vacuuming of the, the duct work, the replacement of the dampers. Um, and, and our focus is going to be on, um, on doing outreach to MWBE and Section 3 business concerns. Uh, to see if there's an, um, an interest on their part to do this work. Uh, so in addition to having that as part of the existing scope of work, we're also looking to do um, additional contracts just for that service alone. Okay, so I'm just hearing now that, you know, you're looking to do a, a specific contract for 
you know, what we were just yeah. asking. But it's already, it already is in the contracts that we have let out for the replacement of the roof bands. Yes, that is a line is item in the contract. Yeah, okay. and if I may, um, uh, the uh, to to address um, the general manager's request for me to talk about the oversizing of the roof fan. So while our our pilot study was very small, we were dealing with three roof fans. Um, uh, we uh, uh, kept kind of like two size roof fan, which means what you would. Um, you know, the appropriate size, right? And then we oversized another roof fan by one model up and then another roof fan by two models up to see what the impact is. Um, what we've done, um, and this was done side by side with the independent mold assessor microcologist team. Um, they uh, evaluated what the readings were from an anometer before and after the installation without clearing that uh, 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 debris that we're talking about, the dust debris. Um, and the preliminary findings, you know, seemed promising. They seem that um, we could say that there is a correlation between oversizing and sucking some of that uh, debris out uh, up to the shaft. Um, so, um, that is why we are, uh, you know, in con uh, con uh, in partnership with microcologies, you know, supported that uh, approach that we should instruct the engineers when they are scoping out and making recommendation uh, what the CFM output should be to oversize the roof fans. But okay. again, um, of course, clearing uh, the process that Vito was talking about and Vlada um, is very important and risky. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate that. Um, um, Audrey, is, are there any other council members? There are none. There are none? Okay. Um, we have, it's been close to three hours. That was um, not really anticipated. Um, and so I want to be able to allow for, um, you know, who we have from the public to um, speak and testify. Um, and so I have no further questions for NYCHA. Um, I just hope that we, now that we're in October, there are so many lessons learned from the spring and the summer, and we've lost a lot of um, people during a pandemic and um, you know some we know died in their apartments and um, it's just been one tragic story after the other um, and I know that there are you know some amazing NYCHA workers who are on the front lines um, doing a really hard job and also you know amazing resonance who are advocating and leading the charge as well. Um, and so I just really hope that we will continue to have just roundtable discussions, um, you know, continuous meetings in order to make sure that all residents are just basically safe. And, you know, we have a way to make sure that the apartments that they live in are actually healthy and not necessarily um, continuing to exacerbate the underlying conditions that we all know that so many people have in our communities, including myself. Um, and so that's the purpose of this oversight hearing was to get an update on where you are um, with mold abatement, what, you know, to get a sense of a picture of the units um, and the training and how we move forward. Um, and so I'm not sure where we, I'm, 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 I really don't have a clear picture, um, but I really hope that we figure this out um, as the numbers continue to rise. Um, and so with that, I will, hold on for a second. Sorry, I was just trying to make sure my staff is coming in to make sure I, I, I asked all the questions. 
Um, so with that being said, you know, I just really look forward to continued conversations uh, with NYCHA, the administration, um, and the federal monitor um, in the weeks to come. And so with that, thank you so much. And I know you'll stick around for the public portion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We will now move on to uh, testimony from members of the public. Please listen for your name. Uh, I will call one name at a time. Uh, in addition to the name of the member of the public, testifying next. Uh, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the sergeant at arms will set the timer to announce that you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to five minutes. I would now like to welcome Jutulio Cruz to testify, followed by Ray Lopez. Time starts now. Hey folks, please stand by. We're experiencing some technical difficulties. We'll be uh, right back as soon as uh, we get this sorted. Once again, uh, folks, this is Chief Sergeant Terrence Rafael Perez. Uh, this is the Committee on Public Housing. We are experiencing some, te some technical issues. Uh, please stand by. We should, be have it. we should have it all sorted out in a few minutes. Give me a, uh, give me a second. Uh, I'm sorry. Hey, Megan. Hey. Do you have an error code on your end? I do not see an error code on my end. Okay, I, I have an error code. I can't log on from my own account. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna log off from yours. And I'll just- you're already on here. Can you co-
Hi, all. We'll be starting as soon as the chair returns to the hearing. Thanks. Once again, uh, good afternoon to all the folks that are watching this hearing. This is, this is the remote uh, hearing of the New York City Council on public housing. For those of you that are waiting to testify, please stand by. We should be calling you shortly. We're just sorting out some technical difficulties. Thank you so much for your patience.
Hello? No, I'm here. Hello? We can hear you. They're trying to silence us. <laughs> <laughs> I am so sorry, Chair. This this is definitely a connection issue. Um, we're trying to make sure that everyone that is here to um, testify in public testimony, we get them back. Um, so anyone that is out there and needs to log back in, you can log back in. I will check in with them to make sure that they come back though. Uh, once again, thank you all very much. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer to announce Folks, as you as you've all noticed, we've had some technical issues. We are trying to get the meeting back and we are waiting for our chairperson. So if you can just please bear with us for a moment and we will resume momentarily. Thank you. Okay, I believe the chair is present as are the members of the public who are registered to testify. So we will proceed uh, with their testimony. I would now like to welcome Jutulio Cruz to testify followed by Ray Lopez. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. I am Reverend Getulio Cruz Jr., pastor of Montesion Christian Church, located in the Lower East Side. Thank you, Chair Ampri Samuel and uh, City Council for allowing us to share our experiences. Uh, thank you, CM Torres, for your exemplary leadership. Fixing mold in general and to strongly endorse the City Council's bill to ensure everyone knows about the great services of the mold ombudsperson in particular. New York City Metro IAF is the largest network of faith-based institutions, schools, and community organizations leading our, our city forward to, for everyone. Because tens of thousands of our members, including half my congregation, live in public housing we have been working with tenant leaders for over 20 years to document problems to fight for repairs and improvements. Uh, while NYCHA says 98% of the fans are working, we know that in the past, NYCHA workers didn't know how to properly inspect roof fans, and we have no evidence that their inspections have improved. Uh, we took NYCHA to federal court, and in December 2013, forced them to sign a historic class action consent decree in Baez versus NYCHA that required them to fix almost all mold cases in 15 days or less. After four long years of continued breach, 
we and our legal team, and with the support of the 2016 appointed special master, fixing mold and leaks properly. They identified specific things that NYCHA could do that would solve most mold and leak problems if competently executed, as detailed in the bias versus NYCHA joint status report submitted to the court on May 2020, where we acknowledge, and I quote, significant progress has been made under the revised consent decree, but much is left to be done. Four months ago, we were hopeful that the progress would continue at a steady pace, but have been grievously disappointed. Far too many tenants are still suffering from mold and leaks, and in far too many cases, NYCHA is still not living up to its commitments. Um, here are four simple ways for NYCHA to address it. First, replacing all roof fans. As NYCHA has known since 2016, uh, it, it was further determined that most of NYCHA's current fans were not providing enough ventilation to the 65% of bathrooms that depend on them. And in August of 2019, after we made the case that this was a compromise, tenants' health and safety. As Greg Smith's story in the city, New York City, this morning points out, there is strong reason to believe it is critical to protecting tenants from COVID-19. <clears throat> we, um, we need more mold remediation workers. We need uh, to resolve the scheduling problems as the independent experts have confirmed many of the complications in fixing mold and leaks come from NYCHA employees not showing up for appointments, not informing tenants of when they will come or showing up in the wrong order. Two solutions have been identified. Fully hire the 30 resident coordinators required under the HUD action plan who are responsible for ensuring communication between tenants and staff. Tenants who have worked with the 19 RCs through the OCC are having a far better experience. Second, fully implement the automated scheduling system designed to improve scheduling and eliminate bottlenecks in the repair process. A pilot of this system finally began this month. Four, they need to repair the leak, uh, the leak standards, complete the leak standard procedure. This is critical because leaks accounted for 77% of open work orders at the end of quarter 23. However, some real progress has continued over this period particularly thousands of tenants who have contacted the independent mold and leak ombudsperson call center have seen real relief. And my colleague, uh, Ray Lopez, uh, will now testify on the subject. Time expired. I'm done. So, um, going in and out, and my um, computer actually shut down and then came back up. And um, we're finding out that this is Zoom. Well, this is the this is not the internet necessarily. This is the platform that we're on. And so you just we're all being bounced in and out. And I'm not sure if you see it on your end. Yeah, I, I saw part frozen, but I didn't see that that it, we were in and out. Okay, so what are we gonna do next? So one <laughs> second. Sure. Okay. Miss Sun, Audrey Sun. Yes, thanks again to everybody for your patience. Uh, it seems that Zoom is having some major connectivity issues on their end, which as the chair mentioned, is not really something that we are able to address on our end. The Public Housing Committee is scheduled for another hearing on another topic on uh, October 21st at 1 p.m. Um, if we could ask for the patience of the members of the public who are registered to testify today one more time to return on the 21st to present their testimony then, we will be able to receive it then and hopefully the connectivity issues will be resolved. Um, but for now, I think we'll plan to, as the issues continue to um, persist. Hello? Audrey, we can adjourn this to the 21st hearing and we'll just start with 
the public panel. It just went out for me again, so. Okay, thank you. And I will be sure to follow up with the members of the public who are registered to testify today to ensure that um, you get the invitation for the 21st. Thank you. How does that? Hello? Yes. Do I close? I don't. Do I close right now? What am I doing? Yes, I think you can adjourn and we will. Um, reconvene at the next hearing. Okay. Um, due to technical difficulties, this October 7th, 2020 Committee on Public Housing hearing on an update for COVID-19 uh, and NYCHA will be adjourned until the October 21st hearing will to hear public. Mm-hmm.